Good evening. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of the Town Council for Monday, October 16th, 2017. Jeff, if you could leave us in our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Councilor Bello? Here. Councilor Hammond? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Lotina? Here. Councilor Martino? Here. Councilor Rell? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Berry? Here. And Mayor Montaneri? Here. Thank <coughs> you, Dolores. Um, our first item uh, this evening is a, present, a brief presentation by, uh, I think Patty is leading it on the special registry, Patty. So you have the floor if you want to come up. Good evening, uh, my name is Patty Silva. I'm a resident in town. I live at 24 Hillcrest Avenue. Uh, I'm a parent and um, this is Karen. <laughs> Hello, my name is Karen Tomchuk. I'm lead dispatcher for Wethersfield Police Department and also the Deputy Emergency Management Director for the Town of Wethersfield. Uh, what brings us here tonight is um, an initiative that's been in the works for about two years now. Uh, it's called the Town of Wethersfield Special Needs Registry. And I'm just going to go through this is going to be brief. Um, if you have any questions, we'll try our best to answer them. This is mainly um, a database. It's a voluntary database that uh, residents or families of residents can fill out if they have some type of a special need, whether it be medical or uh, like an intellectual disability, that sort of thing. So if there's ever an emergency um, call or uh, EM EMTs, um, police, fire, there, something will trigger in a database and let them know that there's somebody e either in that location or um, if they find somebody walking on the road who, who could be lost and they're able to give their name, and if that person is in the database, information on them will come up so that it'll assist the first responders um, to be able to do their work um, in, a, in a, you know, dignified manner. So, um, go ahead here. Um, the background, how, how this got started was um, there was a meeting a few years ago and it happened to be about the relocation of the Weathersfield um, Transition Academy. And during discussions and dialogue about locations, things like that, um, towards the end of the meeting, I had brought up the idea of having some type of a special need registry in town. Um, my daughter Bella is 18 now and um, while she's, you know, pretty independent, there are always some things that you're never quite sure if she somehow, <laughs> some way happened to be, you know, by herself and wasn't able to relay information, but was able to get her name out, um, that, that it would give me a lot of peace of mind knowing that there was more information out there that could help somebody who, you know, was there trying to help her. So, um, let's see. Um, so over the years, there were various members uh, of town, uh, several town departments who have been involved in this. It first started out with um, myself, Karen, and Hal Even. Um, who is uh, the director of security and residency for the schools. And um, so we started off in discussions, we did research, tried to find out what other towns um, or municipalities across the country were doing. And there wasn't a whole lot out there. So, um, but Karen did a lot of digging um, and um, we were able to find some forms that we could use as templates. So. We went through a, a lot of discussions. Uh, Kathy Bagley got involved. Um, let's see who else we had. Um, actually, and, and then I was invited to attend the EOC meetings, which involve representatives from just about every um, department in town, um, and went through discussions there and you know answered questions and kind of really ironed out you know what we needed to do to kind of get this off the ground. So. Um, 
like I said, the purpose is to maintain a registry of persons who wish to inform first responders um, and emergency management of their special needs or circumstances, and to be able to you know, give them the proper background information um, needed for an effective responder citizen contact. Um, and where you can find this downloadable form, right now it's currently on the police department webpage and it is under programs Correct. and forms. So um, I'm going to take you to that. Let's see if I can figure out, oh, how do I get down to the, all right, Jeff, how do I get back to the, um... <laughs> <laughs> you just click that link. That I, all right, I'll have go to go do it that way because I already had it loaded. It took a little while to load. Open? Yeah, mm -hmm. but it, it's just going to take a few minutes to load. It's already open. But oh, here we go. Um, so this is what the form looks like, and what residents can do is download it and print it out, um, and it explains what it's for, and there are some eligibility categories that in order to be able to be put into this database, and again, it's all voluntary, um, you would need to meet those conditions. Uh, the first one is um, a resident with mobility or cognitive slash intellectual disabilities. Um, and the second is for an individual who has a condition that should be brought to the attention of first responders who are responding to the resident's home. And it goes into a little bit more detail um, on, on what those conditions would be. Um, if somebody was being uncooperative, hostile, erratic, and has a history of that, or um, somebody who's blind or deaf, uh, any other types of disabilities that were described, that are described in category three. Um, and then this one here is for, um, Con any conditions that would make an individual at risk for wandering from their residence, school, or other um, becoming disoriented or being able, unable to adequately communicate with others in order to get back to their place of safety. So once you've determined that somebody is eligible under one of those three categories or more than one of the categories, um, you would go ahead and fill it out and um, you would send it or drop it off at the police department. And there are contact numbers there if anybody needs assistance or has questions. Uh, and this is the form itself. It asks for the name of the resident and some personal information. Um, we're really hoping that people will attach photos as well because that really helps in identifying. Um, so there's you know, scars, identifying marks, spe specific conditions or disabilities, um, and any other uh, medical conditions that um, anybody should be aware of that's responding. Um, and then just more information about the individual themselves and any other that you want to add in there that might assist. And then emergency contact information for two, two individuals that could be contacted in regard to the person with special needs. And then there's a kind of a disclaimer that it's the responsibility of um, either the individual or the person who originally um, submitted this application to annually update it if you know if there are any changes um, and and then they sign it and drop it off or send it in um, so let's see here so that's the form itself um, so as I said, right now it's housed um, under forms or programs on the police department page. And we're hoping that um, there will be possible additional future locations within pages on the town website. Um, maybe the fire department, um, social youth and senior services, um, board of ed. Um, and I would like to at this time um, just really thank everyone who over the past couple of years has helped along with this. Um, it's taken a lot of, you know, 
back and forth and trying to be thoughtful and um, allowing people to retain their dignity while still you know being served we have excellent first responders and we want to help them continue to to you know maintain the high caliber of work that they do while also allowing our, our citizens to maintain their dignity as well too um, so I just really wanted to thank everybody who's been involved I know you know Jeff Bridges was was helping out along the way as well too and um, I know Tony and Paul and Steve, you guys have been supportive of it. And so, I don't know if anybody had any questions as far as um, anything to do with police and dispatch. That's Karen's forte. <laughs> any questions? If I could. Oh, go ahead. Patty, I don't have any questions, but I applaud you um, for putting this forward. I remember when it came up in some of the discussions related to the Transitional Academy, and I think this is really a, um, a first for us, and it's a, a really nice to have as a, um, a daughter of a person who had Alzheimer's and was just getting to the wandering point at, in, you know, during one time, it was very difficult. Um, and you're not, you're right, you don't necessarily want to offer up that kind of information, but you also want your family member to be safe if they do um, wander. And we know that that is, can, can be problematic. So really appreciate, appreciate the efforts, the research, um, looking to put this out there for the families and community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just say one thing. I do want to thank Patty Silva for all the work that she has done and research as well. She came really at a great time because we were starting to have our emergency management meetings as well as we've had a couple storms where we've received numerous calls from citizens in the town uh, requesting assistance for things and how they can go about alerting us to family members and needs. And this actually just ended up just working out very well and the partnership with the citizens and to provide a better service you know chief citran helping us along the way and our town manager jeff bridges and james ritter from emergency management along with um, tom mitney as well helping us do our formats and more research um, we're happy to bring this forth and we hope people do use this and if any questions at all please don't hesitate to give the police department a call anytime <coughs> we can help you in filling out forms or answering any of your questions so if there isn't any questions i was just going to say this would be a great presentation to bring to the disabilities committee um, a lot of the folks there could probably help network some of the um, marketing or some of the, the outreach I've actually been in contact with um, Kathy Kenya, who's a parent, um, yeah. so she's aware of it. Just timing-wise, we their meetings were mm -hmm. off, and so um, they they have been made aware of it. So we will be, you know, getting in contact with them again too to help with the rollout and make sure that we get it everywhere we can. So, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Patty Karen. Thank you. Public comment? Anyone wish to speak? Sin? I'm not here to talk about the turf tonight. I thought you guys, well, maybe, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> Sydney Zervless, 119 to Rod Highway. Um, I'm actually here tonight, first of all, to thank each of you, along with the Board of Ed members, for volunteering your time to serve our town. What you, do, what you all do is a tough job to make decisions that at times can sometimes upset residents, and it's not easy. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, though, I know that each and every one of you 
are here because you care about our town and our residents in it. And I just wanted to, wanted to personally come here and thank each and every one of you for doing a great job. I really appreciate it. I also know that each of you, both council and board of ed members, have had to deal with angry residents, which I know is not fun. I too am a public servant. And I know how it feels to be yelled at, sworn at, and I've even faced physical threats by customers. But at least at the end of my week, I get a paycheck. You guys do this all for volunteer. You lose time from your friends, your family, and it's tough. People, need, people sometimes forget that. Which brings me to the main reason why I felt the need to come here tonight, angry residents at town council meetings. At the last town council meeting, a resident by the name of Robert Young approached this very podium, which he has for, I want to say, at least the last 20 years that I can remember. I know I've been involved with the Democratic Town Committee, and he's been back and forth quite a few times. And he gave another one of what I'll call one of his outlandish speeches. He was talking about the taxpayers footing the bill for job training programs for young adults with intellectual disabilities and inquiring when the taxpayer's responsibility should come to an end. Well, I'm here to say when it comes to individuals with disabilities like this, Mr. Young, I want you to know we're never going to be done with helping people with special needs. I, just as all the residents in this com community, except for you, apparently support our federal, state, and local governments all day long when it comes to supporting any program that helps a child or an adult with a disability. And I don't know a human with a heart or any empathy that wouldn't feel the same way about it. What I don't support as a resident is listening to Mr. Young month after month week after week, stand at this podium talking about issues that you as council members and Board of Ed members have no power over. Mr. Young fails to realize when he stands here many times that the things he is complaining about our council has no control over. It's a federal, it's a state decision. Go talk to them. I also know that I am not the only resident in this town who is sick and tired of listening to him. Mr. Young, go address your issues with the federal and state representatives as we are tired. If Mr. Young is so unhappy in our town, why doesn't he just move? It's that simple. He arrives here every week at council and board members, which I admit it is your right, it is his right, and he moans about all the problems that he thinks we're having. In his speech last week, it went way too far for me. It was disgusting in my words, to say the least. As a matter of fact, let me share some of the comments that were written on Facebook by numerous residents after hearing his speech last week. Speechless, foolish, not dignified, should have been physically removed from the meeting. Made me sick. Sad and hard to read. Damn fool. I can go on, but I won't. Because I was getting sick just reading them all, knowing myself that someone in this town actually thought this way. Mr. Young, instead of being part of the problem, as you always are, why don't you for once in your life become the solution? We, have the, we as the residents of this town are tired of listening to you moan every week. And as a matter of fact, because of you, the lights in the town hall have to stay on longer every time there's a meeting. The staff has to stay longer because you just don't know when to be quiet. So if anything, you're pontificating is costing the taxpayers more money. In closing, I would like to say, Mr. Young, I hope one day that Mr. Young, when he continues to grow old, that he's got a lot of money in the bank. Because when he ends up in a, in a convalescent home, I, as a taxpayer, 
in this state don't want to fund his medical care if he ever ends up on Title 19. See, Mr. Young, you fail to realize that many of us at some point in our life might need assistance. So you should, be, should not be picking on those who might be less fortunate than you because it might come back to bite you. It's called karma. You should watch out for it. I feel very sorry for you that you're such an angry person and, and don't want to help those that are less fortunate than you. Hopefully one day you will change your tune. In closing, I just want to thank the council for the football field. Um, the boys, they love it, and they said it feels like they're playing on a mattress. And yes, Bob, your taxes did pay for that field, but so did mine. And the boys love it. Thank you. Good evening, Paul Kopp, 100 Executive Square, Chairman of the Independence Party. Uh, Bob was a little bit loud at the last meeting, and he has, has done a great deal for the town. And in the next few months, you will see exactly how much he has done. When some of the things that he has <clears throat> pointed out will come to bear, because they will be taken to the proper authorities, as you suggested. Uh, but in any case, Steve, thank you for all you've done. And Donna, you too. I, uh, both of you have been very, very helpful to me personally. And you, uh, I was still trying to remember the name of the judge who was a moderator at that first debate that we uh, attended. In any case, thank you so much. Well, the election is almost here, and I want to point out a couple of dirty tricks that some of us have been, you know, used to. Last election, it was a sign. Somebody stole all my signs off the lawns of the, uh, where I had placed them. And uh, now we have another. The Channel 14 has a uh, need for product, for production. And I offered to put on an hour program where we would be talking about town management and all of the problems and the successes of the town. But, you know, since I'm running for office as a town councilor, the, uh, all of a sudden there was nobody to help me. There was no one to handle the lights, no one to handle the audio, no one to handle the, uh, the cameras. Now, I offered to train somebody. I had a person who was, you know, responsible at the ESPN for these sorts of things. But you know what? Then I couldn't get a key to the studio. So, anyway, thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Always a delight to work with you. Now, the, it's that time, Paul, for your brochure before the, the election. The, uh, the last time, uh, it was the Weight Watchers building facility, and Ashley Furniture is doing a marvelous job. Now, this time, it'll be what? I don't know. There's a, in a stack of papers that we have tonight, the uh, 1.4 or 1.6, I forget what it is, tax abatement. 
And that tax abatement, I believe, should be handled by the new council. Then most of you won't be here as the council for the next time, four of you. And uh, hopefully the town manager will be gone as well. The, I don't know how to answer you in your comments as a speaker, the first one today. Uh, Bob does get intense when he talks about many of these things. I think the subject was uh, perhaps not one that we should have talked that much about. Thank you very much. Gus? Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. And before I go on with my spell, I, got, I have to say that, uh, like the young lady thanked the council here for doing a, a, a wonderful job. I agree. I think it's good. But with the same token, I also see Bob every meeting right here. And if he did not really care about the town of Wethersfield, I don't think he would be here. Because every meeting, now I don't know what's going on tonight. Last meeting I was not able to attend it, but uh, whatever it happened, I don't know. And there is many more people tonight than on the average, three or four. Why are we here? Because we have something to say. Why are we here? Because we do care, in spite of what the young lady said. I've known Bob for a long time, and he makes a lot of sense. He does care, though, where we spend the money because he's a working guy and he has to work for this. I know a lot of people, they don't. Now, I guess she must hate me, too, because I come right here now for a few years. Guess what? About the stop sign. And I cannot get an answer. Now the police chief is right here. I would like to know, really, who's responsible for the stop sign? on Morrison Avenue and Orchard. The mayor has said that many times that it's not up to him, it's not up to this body, it's not up to the town, but it's up to the state. I talk to the state, they tell me, says, no, it's not. It's not up to, it's a local road, so it's up to the town. And I talk with the police, uh, an officer, and he says, no, it's up to the town manager. Now. The fact that I cannot get an answer doesn't really bother me that much. But what it bothers me the most that probably when the mayor told me and everybody around here that it was up to the state, and yet the town manager was sitting next to him, I think that's wrong. And yet he did not say a word. There is something going on. And as long as I do not get an answer, I'm sorry, but the lights are going to be on for a little bit longer. Thank you. Mary? Hello, Mary Breton, 209 Clovercrest. Um, I'd like to thank, um, start off by thanking Paul and Steve for your service and your leadership um, and the accomplishments. I'd also like to thank Donna. Um, I understand um, you guys have done a, a, a wonderful job um, in terms of setting the stage for collaboration, it's which this town needs. It's how we solve problems. Um, there has been a great example of um, leadership and collaboration, um, economic development. The town is vibrant. I'm proud to be a Wethersfield resident. I've been here for 19 years, three children um, through the school system, um, and I am very proud of what we have accomplished and the quality of life that we have here. Um, there is always room for improvement. Um, we know that. Um, I support the Celestine project. Um, I, I uh, believe that it'll bring uh, a lot of revenue to the town. I think it's a wonderful um, uh, thing that's happening, and I had um, understood that, that there was a lot of support from, um, from the whole council, and I hope that continues. 
Um, I think that um, the leadership and um, has set the stage for collaboration, and I'd like to see that continue um, because that's how we get things done. Um, I'd also like to just bring up um, the fact that we are going to have some challenges. We all know that um, they are coming. Um, most of the municipalities um, are going to have those kinds of things um, to address. Um, and it's important when we look at those challenges, there's two important factors that I'd like to just bring up um, that are in, critical to the success and will set the stage for that. Um, one of which is to make sure that we have a broad view of when we look at these issues and challenges before us. Um, it, if we um, look at things with one lens, spending money and taxes, we lose sight of the entire picture. We're a community. Um, we invest in our community, and when we do that, we get a return. And the return that we see is in our schools. Um, we see it in um, programs like the Transition Academy. Um, and we think about what our residents need, and we look at that in the entire spectrum, and that's important. Um, to us and our quality of life. Um, when we just focus on spending and taxes, um, we lose sight of the fact and we start insulting and, um, you know, some just not, uh, not helpful or very actually degrading and disparaging comments towards a wonderful program. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir. Most of us are in support of the Transition Academy and those kinds of programs um, to enable our children to become, um, you know, go to their full potential um, is the right of every single kid in this town. Um, as a parent, um, I, I, I know it's challenging just to be a parent. Um, and when I look at the parents here um, and the challenges they face, um, not the least of which is from people who insult them um, and don't have an open mind about um, understanding that we're all humans and we need that kind of um, support from our community. Um, and so uh, I would caution, you know, I know there's, there's stuff out there on Facebook about taxes and um, why, why they're happening, and, um, but I'm a little bit confused by that because we, um, we know that we, we have a great school and everybody was in support of it. There was a referendum. Um, we had uh, uh, information out there that everybody understood what the taxes would be. Um, and a lot of that um, is caused by the fact that we all agreed that we were going to uh, fix our high school and make it uh, top notch. So um, I'm not quite sure on that. The second thing that we need is a vision. Um, so we, we have to make sure that um, our vision includes um, hope for everybody in the town. Um, and that means, you know, that we, um, we are um, supporting our residents, um, we are inclusive, um, we are not criticizing and insulting them. Um, at the highest, we're at a time now in our country where at the highest levels um, we're hearing insults on a daily basis, multiple times a day. Um, and, you know, but we're better than that. We work together as a team um, and, and I think we can accomplish things. Um, in my experience, um, my professional experience, I've worked on a number of projects, led several of them, and the difference between a successful project and one that fails um, comes down to one, one thing, and, and it's not that um, it doesn't have to do with the amount of funding, resources, time uh, uh, that you have or roadblocks. It has everything to do with the collaboration of the people, with open minds, with thinking about things from a, a wide spectrum um, and listening to a diverse uh, opinions. And when you do that and you have hope and critical thinking, you can really knock the socks off of, um, off of everything. And so I think that you know, it's a question of whether we want to be problem solvers or do we want to go to this place where we're critical and negative um, and we don't get along. Um, and, I, and I think that we can't, we can't allow that. So, um, so thank you. Thank you. Ken? Ken Lesser, 8 Hawthorne Way. I want to do two things really quickly. First, I want to thank all of the counselors for their service. I know how difficult a job it is and the time you spend. And it really means a lot to me and to everyone else because you're making decisions for our families, for us, for all our fellow residents. So can't thank you enough. And Donna, Steve, and Paul, as you guys transition off 
extra and double thanks. Donna, I know you've served a long time and as mayor and in other capacities, thank you. Steve, everyone has such a great word to say about you all the time, just a class act, thank you. And Paul, leading this town as mayor, very difficult job, you've done a, done a great job. So the three of you, I wish you all the best and all the best to the rest of the councilors. The second reason I wanted to speak tonight is I wanted to speak in favor of the economic development project. I serve on the economic Development Improvement Commission. This is one of the most significant opportunities for Weathersfield that we've had in years. This ultimately will be one of the top 10 taxpayers in town. These types of opportunities don't come around that often. All the groups that have looked at this so far have blessed it, have, have approved it. We have a great uh, local resident uh, developer from here. Um, and this project is going to be you know, we talk about the future a lot. This project is going to be something great for the future of all of us here in Weathersfield. It helps build a better community, and I urge everyone to support it tonight. Thank you, everybody. Hi, Deborah Cohen, 73 Church Street. I will be very brief. I certainly want to... Um, echo the sentiments of respect and appreciation to the council. Um, I have, and I may possibly continue to have some differences with council decisions or in actions, but I hope that I will always be respectful in putting those to you. So um, on that note, I would just like to say we heard a lot tonight. We heard words like um, caring and respect and diversity and equal opportunity. So I'm just here to remind you that the town really needs its Human Rights and Relations Commission revived. We have work to do. We obviously have people in our community who care a lot about everybody else in the community. So I'm asking you once again, please let's get this moving because we are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Other public comment? Yes, in the back and light blue. Uh, my name is Sean Duffy. I'm from 10 John Lane, and I came tonight to support the economic development incentives for the Borden project uh, for three reasons. One is that it's a, the, the incentives seem to make great business sense. That the Taxes for this project never go backwards. It's only a question of how fast they rise. It's a small inducement for a great project. The, the second reason is that it's a, a development of a blighted property, that, and it's a unique opportunity in time, um, which uh, previous speakers have addressed. And last, and I, this is not the smallest reason, is that Mr. Kenny is not only a developer of great Class A property, which um, we could all visit in various towns, but he's a resident, he's a neighbor, a taxpayer. Our interests are aligned. And uh, for all of those reasons, he has significant and similar interest as we do in that project success. And I'm quite certain that he won't let his friends down. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Fabian? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. <clears throat> the first lady or the second lady that was up here talking about me uh, should realize that this article in the paper said, advocates plead for program funds. And it goes on about the, mo the money that they need and, and the services that they provide. And of course, the reason is to ask the state legislatures to get a budget together so they can get their funds. That's what it all boils down to, getting their funds. I oppose to a lot of this expenditures. I keep reading in the paper different groups going to Harford asking for their funds that they want. The taxpayer themselves is out of the picture with the exception of the tax bill. Whatever cranks out later on and, and how much money they need, 
That's what we have to end up paying. That's the same level right here at the town of Wethersfield. No matter what you spend at the end of the day, the citizens have to pony up. And I'm just tired of it. I've been coming here uh, not for 20 years, probably 12 or 14, but it's not 20. And the fact remains that I've seen a lot of things happening here that I don't think are good business practices. And the same with the state of Connecticut, extremely poor business practices. Now, I know this won't go away, and you know I won't go away. You will go away, Mayor, and some others as well. But I'll still be here putting up the fight, the fight to try to keep taxes down. And if, if it means cutting, and I've said a lot of places that we could cut costs, but again, the town of Wethersfield has absolutely no backbone nor does the state of Connecticut have any backbone. And now only the reason we're going to get some cuts is because we're broke. We have been living on borrowed money for so darn long. $74.3 billion the state of Connecticut has for long-term obligations. 74.3 or 4 billion the state of Connecticut owes. And they've been, they've been borrowing. And, and think about this, folks. When Governor Malloy came on board up at the state capitol, we had approximately $60 billion in debt, long-term debts. Today, it's 74.3. And a lot of that money has been funding programs that we just cannot afford. Our tax revenues that go into the state of Connecticut bucket are not there. There's less going into the bucket today. And we need to find ways of cutting costs. I don't know how else, I don't know how else a business could go on. I know Government, as the manager would tell me, the town or government is not a business. But guess what? The business or the government depends on money. That's M-O-N-E-Y. Something that they've run out of. We have mortgaged to the hilt. Today, as of Friday, my understanding was S&P, Standard & Poor's, downgraded the state of Connecticut again. You're not going to get the money, folks. You know, we have overborrowed and we are in big trouble and, and we need to do some cuts. You know, tonight you also have on your agenda for what, 1.6, 1.4 million dollars for a, a tax abatement. And when I looked at that, all I could think of, Mayor, was two years ago or four years ago. Every two years, we have a special deal that comes up the day, days before the election. I think it started under your administration, where we had the Weight Watcher deal, which never came to fruition. We got nothing except for you got some points at the election booth. And and that's not the way to do things, Mayor. You know, be fair about things. If you don't have a deal, you don't have a deal. And getting that back to this deal, we're supposed to be such a fantastic town. Everybody wants to come here. And whoever this developer is, and I have no idea who he is, if he wants to come here, he should pay the price to come here. Not say, Oh, state of Connecticut, I need some money for me to come to do some business in Wethersfield. Oh, town of Wethersfield, I need some, I need some tax rebates. You know where that happens? That stuff happens in Harford. That stuff happens in Bridgeport and, and New Haven. It should not happen in a town as prosperous as ours. I mean, after all, you've been running the town for, what, six years, four years? 
And before that, you were deputy mayor. I mean, we should have been booming and booming, and people would come here and be willing to pay, pay, pay. No. They come here and they say, we want something to come to your community. That's, that's about where we are, Mayor. Uh, and and I, would, I would strongly advise you to say no to this program and of all, leave it to the next council, whoever that next council is. And, uh, you know, we need to find ways of cutting costs. We cannot continue to live here and, and, and pay these horrendous taxes that we're paying. And we're, we're, we're paying for every, everybody and anybody. We have to stop this. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the back, thank you. Hi, Steve Walsh, uh, 3D1 Walcott Hill Road. I, in general, I can't say I don't disagree with a lot of the big picture financial uh, end of that. However, um, there is another way to grow a business besides cutting all the time, and that is to grow the top line. So in that uh, vein of thought, I'm in support of the Borden project and the um, tax abatement that you guys are thinking about uh, providing. I don't see it as a, it doesn't appear at first blush that it's a, you know, additional cost. If anything, it's going to increase the tax base. Now, from my perspective, being a conservative Republican, these are not the kinds of things I'm generally for, but, you know, because if we're going to generate an extra $5 million in taxes in the next 10 or 15 years and another $5 million in that in perpetuity, is that money going to go back to us in the form of a refund? No. I understand that's never going to happen. But if you grow the top line, that's oftentimes, you know, soothes a lot of the problems. So it's only one little project, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that right across the street from there, that snake bit place there, who knows, maybe that goes up in value 50%. Maybe that actually survives, you know, and maybe, you know, the place next door, something happens. So, I mean, I also own a property on the Silas Dean, so I'm aware and, and I look at it all the time. And that property, along with a number of the other ones, you know, so some things haven't worked out. But to be honest, I know this starts to turn on politics. And believe me, this, I don't think anybody's votes are swayed on a deal like this. I mean, if it's a deal and it's a good deal and it's going to have a creative virtuous cycle, I mean, I don't think that's people are going to change their core value. So if you're on the other side of it uh, politically, I don't think you should be terribly concerned about it. So anyway, I'm a supporter of that. Thank you. Thank you. Patty. Good evening, uh, my name is Patty Silva and I live at 24 Hillcrest Avenue and we have some other um, citizens here as well who are standing in support and I just wanted to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Lisa Flynn, 19 Nathaniel Drive. Karen Carney, 15 Footpath Lane. Debbie Epp, 11 Windmill Hill. Diane Silva, 148 Bunce Road. Um, I'd like to also begin by thanking the members of our town council. You all have volunteered so much of your time and service to our community and our residents. Um, Donna, Paul, Steve, I, you know, I've known you guys for quite a long time and I have the highest regard and respect for all of the time and the work that you've put in um, and want to say thank you. It's oftentimes a thankless job that can take a toll on family life and sometimes friendships. Please know that you are truly appreciated for all of your efforts to better our community. Uh, I'd like to now address the extremely disturbing public comments that were made by Mr. Robert Young at the October 2nd, 2017 Town Council meeting. Mr. Young spoke about an article regarding advocates plead for program funds which referred to paying for job training programs for young adults with intellectual disability, of which he had very strong feelings against. Throughout the remainder of his public comment, Mr. Young not only insulted the families who raised these beautiful children, but the individuals themselves. He did so in a demeaning and oftentimes bullying manner. 
While Mr. Young continued to rail on with obvious disdain and disgust for our students and their drain on taxpayer dollars, he also was very clear in demanding that we parents need to pick it up. I would invite Mr. Young to take the time to get to know our children and walk the proverbial mile in our shoes. This is not a life we chose, but one that was chosen for us. It's a life that along with its many challenges has also brought us our greatest joy and pride. It is a life that I, for one, would not change for a second. Many of us parents have spent countless hours volunteering, serving on boards, councils, on local and state levels, run support groups, etc., in an effort to not only advocate for our children, but also to share with our community the value and life lessons our children have to offer. I've always said that my daughter Bella teaches us more than we will ever be able to teach her. I believe many other families feel the same way. And we are their voice when they cannot speak for themselves. <clears throat> Mr. Young also mentioned that you folks are voting for eternal life programs without figuring out how to put an end to it. I would have to ask if at some point, if he's done his homework, he would know that this type of policy is set at the state and federal level, not locally. And I'd ask if at some point Mr. Young is going to collect Social Security or will be on Medicare. <coughs> Those might be considered eternal life programs as well. Just some food for thought. With Deputy Mayor Berry's ardent defense of our children that night and through, many, and through the many of the compassionate statements of support we've received over the past few weeks, it's very apparent that families who have children with special needs are very blessed to live in a community as wonderful as Weathersfield. At last week's Board of Education meeting, Board Chairwoman Bobby Granado took the opportunity to succinctly and very firmly address Mr. Young's remarks with regard to educational mandates along with the Board of Ed's resolve and commitment to inclusion and excellence for all Weathersfield students. If you haven't heard her remarks, I encourage you to view them online. We have many true champions on our Board of Ed and Town Council and we're grateful. With regard to meeting decorum and civility, I would like to respectfully offer the following. And please know that this is not a criticism, but hopefully constructive suggestions for moving forward. It's stated in the Town Council Rules of Procedure that the Council will conduct its meetings according to Robert's Rules of Order. These rules may be revised as necessary, except should any of the rules be inconsistent, oh, except that should any of the rules be inconsistent with the provisions of the Charter, then the charter shall prevail. It's important to note that these are not Mr. Robert Young's rules of order. According to Robert's rules, a member can call point of order when they object to a procedure or a personal affront. A point of order is an infraction of the rules or improper decorum in speaking. A point of order must be raised immediately after the error is made. Also on pages 391 through 394 of the 11th edition of Robert's Rules, it shows what decorum is expected in a meeting and any debate. The topic headings read, confining remarks to the merits of the pending question, refraining from attacking a member's motives, addressing all remarks to the chair, etc. Basically, they say that a speaker cannot attack or be disrespectful and is usually the chair's responsibility to rein in that behavior. For instance, before the opening of the debate, or public comment, the chair could make a statement that no disrespectful or bullying language will be allowed in the remarks, and that the chair has the power to stop someone if they feel there is a personal or general attack on an individual or group. The chair has a great deal of power in the conduct of meetings as long as the rules are stated beforehand and are applied equally to all parties. The chair cannot stop a person from speaking in a public forum, but he or she can set the rules of decorum. This is perhaps something that should be discussed with the town attorney for an opinion on how to handle this type of situation in the future. I thank you all for your time and consideration. Other public comment? Tom?
Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> Tonight I'm speaking as a concerned resident and taxpayer and not as a candidate for town council. Tonight's agenda includes item 3A, approval of a tax incentive or tax abatement for the Borden Project on South Dean Highway, the proposed 111 unit apartment complex. <coughs> I'd like to briefly recap some of the history of the project as I recall. About a year ago, the developer Lexington Partners, Marty Kenny, uh, principal working with Paul Montaneri, and later the town of Wethersfield to secure $5 million in state of Connecticut funding comprised of loans, grants, and equity investment to be used towards the redevelopment of the fund zone site. The $5 million was to be used for demolition of the existing building, extensive site work, infill of the below grade property, water sewer, design planning, etc. Next, Lexington Partners applied for and received approvals from both Planning and Zoning and Wetlands Commission. I, atten I attended those Planning and Zoning meetings and specifically recall someone on the Planning and Zoning Commission asking the developer if they would be requesting a tax abatement for this project. I don't recall the exact wording. It was something vague along the lines of not at this time. In other words, they left the door open for future request. Fast forward to Friday morning when I checked the town's website for tonight's meeting agenda and I found 289 pages of documentation, some of which related to the application. <clears throat> the document contains a request by Lexington Partners for an additional $1.4 million of taxpayer money, bringing the total to $6.4 million in taxpayer contributions on a $28 million project. This, this taxpayer contribution equates to 23% of the total project. I read through the documents, which is a lot to absorb in a short period of time, and I found several items buried in the packet that I would ask each of the counselors to consider before they vote on this abatement. First is found on page one of the agenda, where the town manager states, quote, if not approved, it is unlikely the development will occur, end quote. The next item is found in the letter of application from Lexington, <coughs> Lexington Partners. Mr. Kenny states, we also looked closely at the Ridge Road apartment development as the most recent precedent of a tax phasing project that was approved by the council in 2016. It is important to consider that the Ridge Road developers stated up front that they would need a tax abatement approval before they even proceeded with the development, design work, and applications, zoning approval, et cetera, and that the tax abatement approved by this council <clears throat> for the Ridge Road project was two years, not six, and valued at $400,000 and not $1.4 million. And lastly, which I think is the most significant item, is a memo from the Wethersfield tax assessor, uh, Fauna Eller, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but I'm going to summarize some of it. <clears throat> uh, Fauna contacted the Glastonbury Assessor's Office and spoke in regards to the tannery. The tannery is a much larger complex that was uh, constructed by the same developer. The land was purchased for $3.7 million and had significant contamination issues, which required uh, a significant investment to remediate the contamination. <clears throat> the tannery consists of 250 apartment units, much bigger than the project uh, in Wethersfield. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's much more expansive, and the project has uh, 32 acres of 250 units. Mr. Kenny had told the town of Glastonbury he would not be able to do the project without some sort of help from the town in the form of a tax reduction uh, program. However, he still did build the program and it is nearing completion. The town of Glastonbury does not have a tax incentive program. Mr. Kenny, Lexington Partners, and the design team, engineers, attorneys, the best in the state of Connecticut, and financial planners are all extremely knowledgeable and have invested a massive amount of time and money to come to this point where they're ready to put a shovel in the ground. I do not believe that they would have done all this work and invested all the money 
that they have on a marginally profitable project that hinges on a $1.4 million abatement spread out over a six-year period. I ask you all to consider my comments before voting on this application, not only as our elected town officials, but also as Weathersfield uh, taxpayers. Can we really afford to give up this amount of future revenue when we don't even know what we will have to meet our financial obligations in the coming months? I would suggest you vote against this application as presented and renegotiate a better deal for the Weathersfield residents. Thank you for your time. Suzanne Barton, 55 Main Street. Um, I didn't come here planning to speak, but I'm shocked that we're even considering not giving a tax abatement to a developer who's coming in to develop a building that we're currently getting minimal tax dollars for, I would imagine, that has been vacant for years. Nobody else wants to develop it, so people are not running to Weathersfield to do that and how we would even allow that to slip through our hands over $1.4 million in a town this size is astonishing. I lived in Baltimore, very poor areas for many years, and the house I purchased in Baltimore had a 10-year tax abatement along with all of my neighbors. You know what happened to that neighborhood? It grew and it developed, and now, 10 years later, all of those residents turned $20,000 row homes into $300,000 row homes that the town is now getting tax dollars for. So it amazes me that we're even having this discussion. This is a building that needs to be developed and we need to do everything we can to make this town better in the long term. I will be a long term resident and I will be very happy when we are getting those taxes back and happily give them that money now. Not give them that money, allow them to not pay us a little bit of money in the beginning. Thank you. Peter. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Peter O'Keefe, Seven Clove Hill. Um, tonight I'm here to speak in favor of the tax incentive that the, uh, for the Borden project at 1178 Silestine Highway. Back in January of 2004, the town set the tax incentive plan. It wasn't this town council that did it. We did it for a particular reason. And one of the purposes was to attract, retain, and or expand businesses in the town of Wethersfield. We've had a property there that's an eyesore to the town. It's an embarrassment to the town, and it's been there for a period of time. And I think what this develop, developer is doing is remarkable. He's willing to invest in our town 20 to $28 million of money to improve our town. We're not giving him money. As was said, it's a tax abatement. We're currently getting about $40,000 of taxes on this property. Once the improvements are made, yes, the assessed value goes up, and yes, we could tax it more. But what we're saying is, in exchange for your putting $28 million of money into this project, we're not going to make you pay all of that increase of tax right away. We're abating that tax for a period of time. That's going to come back to us at the end of that seven-year period. We're going to get all that tax dollar money. And we have residents there, and we have businesses there. We have a restaurant there. It's going to spur additional growth in the town. We're trying to attract young kids to this town young professionals to this town. What better way of doing that than getting some apartments there that are market rate apartments with a restaurant, with uh, some retail, right across the street from other businesses. You've got the corner property uh, where the Tilted Kilt was. I think the last thing that did well there was Abdow's. And that's going back a ways. And perhaps we can get something else there where these young kids will go out or seniors that elect to size down and move in there will go out to eat and spend money. So we're going to have construction workers spending money. We're going to have people moving in spending money. 
businesses will see that the town is open for business and will want to go there, will want to come here and do things. This isn't a political issue. This is not a Republican Democratic issue. This is a win-win for the town. It's a win-win for the businesses of the town. It shouldn't be politicized as a timing situation. The town council has no control over when somebody applies for a permit, when somebody goes to planning and zoning, when they're eligible to apply for a town incentive. It just so happens that the time is now. It's not a can we should kick down the road and say, leave it to the next council. It's a good idea. It's a great idea. It's a win-win for the town. We're not going to lose any money. In fact, this is going to be one of the top 10 taxpayers in the future of the town. And I would urge you to do this in a bipartisan way and support this project nine to nothing. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Christy Salters Pedno, 15 Fairmont Street. Um, I came tonight to speak in favor of the economic development package and uh, the tax abatement. Um, but I wanted to say something first um, that I think is actually a thread that might connect both of the issues that people have been talking about tonight. Um, there seems to be sometimes some reluctance in our town to invest in our people and in our uh, town property, our physical property. Um, and I don't really understand it. In our own finances, we invest our money to make more money. <laughs> That's what we do so that we can have uh, longevity and we can have retirement. And um, I don't understand why when it comes to our town, suddenly that same principle doesn't apply. Um, so I really hate to reduce the idea of the Transitions um, Academy to money, but I get a sense that maybe there are some people in the audience who only speak the language of money and not of morals or of uh, humanity. So let me speak to money. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you the story through someone who I love very much, my brother, who was born with an intellectual disability. If my brother had been born 50 years earlier, he might have lived in an institution his entire life costing the taxpayers thousands of dollars every year, but also living an incredibly poor quality of life. Instead, he grew up in Connecticut, and he had access to job training and education. And as a result, he lives an incredibly quality life. In fact, he couldn't be here tonight. He's too busy. But he, um, he also uh, is a contributing member of our society. He pays taxes. He pays market rent for his apartment. He has staff that come in and help him 10 hours a week for less than $20 an hour. So just from a fiscal perspective, the fact that we wouldn't educate everyone in our community makes no sense beyond the moral issue. The same for this economic development package. The idea that we would give up future money because we're being penny wise and pound foolish now makes no sense to me. And so I very much support this economic development project um, and I urge you to vote in favor. Thank you. Mike. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Michael Zaleski. I live at 23 Black Birch Road. Uh, I have served as a member of the Redevelopment Commission for many years. Uh, I'm not here tonight to speak on behalf of the Commission. I'm here to speak with my own personal opinion in favor of uh, the redevelopment of the fun zone. Call it 1178 Silas Dean, call it the Borden Project, call it whatever you'd like. It continues to be an eyesore on the Silas Dean Highway. And for many years, it was the top priority of the Redevelopment Commission as we moved our work forward. Now is the time to move this project forward. There, we can't look back five years from now and say, what if? The qu there was a question earlier, can we afford to do this? I would say, we cannot, can we afford not to do this at this point? This is a good deal with a quality developer who has a proven track record and cares about this town. I urge you all to support the initiative tonight. Thanks. 
<coughs> Thank you, yes. Hello, Casey White, 91 Center Street. I also want to echo the comments of many people here supporting the project, the Borden project. Um, it seems like something we should be moving forward on as fast as we can um, to get that redone. I, I love Weathersfield, but the Silas Dean needs more businesses that are coming in and seeing it as a desirable place to um, you know, bring in new people and new um, economic opportunities. So it's a, a totally useful um, thing for the town to uh, increase our tax income with that. Um, I also want to echo Ms. Deborah Cohen's comments about the Human Rights and Relations Committee. I was shocked to learn that our, that committee is, or commission rather, um, has not been meeting and has faced some difficulties um, with the town in actually meeting and that is a, a big red flag to me as a citizen, as a resident, that for some reason our Human Rights Commission is not being allowed to meet. So that really should get fixed. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Other public comment this evening? David? Good evening, uh, David Kirk, 149 Broad Street. My legs are a little sore. I ran in that 5K the other day, and uh, I, I don't n normally run, so my legs are still sore. I saw Michael Rell out there. I saw Mike Hurley. I saw, I saw, oh, running, Tony, and uh, um, oh, I forgot her name. What's her name? Again? Holly. Uh, uh, pa uh, Paula? Holly Moon. Polly, Polly, yeah. They, they, were run they were in it. They were in it. And, uh, and uh, uh, I paid the price for it. I tried to <coughs> run the whole way, and I'm, now I'm... Very sorry. But anyway, uh, I didn't really have much to say. I used to come here reg more regularly, but uh, I kind of got tired of it. You know, usually you usually get the same people coming here complaining about the same old stuff. But, um, or uh, I was listening to some of the audience. Sometimes I think of something by listening to the audience. And, and I heard one of the speakers mention Robert's rule, rules. They're not here. I'm familiar with it. I was in student government in, in college. But um, I think you guys are doing a good job. And I know the, 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 the um, the chair or, or the mayor has a lot of discretion on, on what he, uh, how what how he enforces those rules. So I think you've been doing a good job. Um, uh, but you're not going to be mayor, so maybe this is a message to the next mayor, whoever it is. Maybe one of you guys up there, uh, possibly. So, um, but I think you guys have been doing a good job. Um, uh, as far as this new uh, uh, construction building, and and like some people say, uh, and I agree. Uh, the Silas Dean, I, I forgot where it was. If it's on Silas Dean, or regardless of where it is, it, you need to, to make money, you have to build. Uh, like the Silas Dean, for many years, everyone was complaining that uh, there's not much development on there, that there's no growth. And, and businesses come and go, and now we're seeing more growth than I've seen in, in many uh, years on the Silas Dean. So I'm, I'm very happy about that, and I could see how it could make money, not just from taxpayers' money, but from new businesses and bringing in people and those apartments with a lot of units, so they're gonna help the businesses out as well. So I think that's a good thing. And, um, and uh, I, I know, I think you have one more town council meeting just before election, is that still on? No, oh, that's canceled? Okay, I looked online, it was still on there. So I guess this is the last meeting for some of you. So I'd like to say goodbye to some of you. I, I probably see you around town. And, uh, and I'll probably be voting for a lot of you guys up there. And there might be some of you not returning. I, but, uh, yeah. I hope most of you return, but uh, that's all I like to say. Thanks. Thanks, David. George. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I kind of came tonight thinking it's getting close to election and we might not have another meeting. I just wanted to see what was going to happen. Well, a lot of interesting things happened this evening. 
I was surprised at some of it. And as I have said in the past on taxes and this new project and all of this kind of stuff that's going on in town, where I am in my life, it probably isn't going to make a hell of a lot of difference. Uh, I have no plans on moving out of Weathersfield, and you all know I have the property down in all Weathersfield down there, which I'm going to be using sometime in the near future. Uh, a couple of things caught my attention that in a way disturbed me. And politics can be a rough game. You can take a lot of, I don't want to use the word abuse, but maybe it is. Maybe it's criticism. Maybe sometimes it's deserved. Sometimes it's not. My own approach always has been to don't be afraid to criticize because if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. But I think it has to be done in some positive, hopefully constructive way. I was stunned by the attacks on Bob. Not that I always agree with Bob, and quite often I do not. And I think in many ways we walk to the tune of a very different drummer. But he's a citizen who wants to speak his word, of which he has a right. And the lady who spoke, although she was very articulate, probably had a lot of carefully prepared notes, and as of this moment, I haven't got a single one except one or two of things I've jotted down. But I don't ever remember her, be, her being here in any way, shape, or form over the many, many years that people have contributed to the running of this community. The, I know sometimes Bob can probably can get under your skin, as I'm sure I have from time to time over the not 10 or 20 years, but probably 40 years of coming to count council meetings and putting my two cents in. I was struck by the, and as I think as I have said not too terribly long ago, all of these things that we're worried about in town, they will get resolved one way or the other. Maybe some, there'll be some disagreements, but something will happen, hopefully for the better of the community, but maybe not, we don't know. And I've been really more concerned about what's happening at the state and federal level, and I'm not going to go into that detail. You know where I stand on those issues. Those are things that I personally am worried about. But the right to be able to come up to this council and hopefully say it always in a respectful, constructive, positive way, I think is a right that we have. And to, to attack and to... To, to encourage, to encourage to restricting that smacks to me of our leader in Washington, as, as, as uh, uh, Ellison has recently very aptly described him, and I'll skip the pronoun that he used or whatever it was he used to describe him. But we don't need that kind of stuff. The things that strike me as the most important things in my life and in the life of the community at large is to be able to have the right in a democracy or republic to be able to stand up in front of a group like this or my country and say what I have to say. And I think Mr. Montaneri, I'm sure he has familiar with Robert's rules, but he has been a very tolerant mayor. And I think he's to be applauded for that ability to permit People like myself, Bob Young, even when some people don't like what he has to say, to come up and share his thoughts. I think those are the things that, to me, are most critical and mean the most to this particular citizen. And the Roberts Rules of Orders, had they been strictly enforced, the young lady would have been required to sit down because in some ways, if she was critical of Bob, she was, you know, she was no less critical than, than, than he was. I mean, she was as, however you want to put it. Um, so, again, I, I, I want to just share those couple of thoughts. Is, and uh, with no notes, I'm just about, <laughs> I think I've said what I wanted to say. 
I know you've been citizens and have worked hard and have ap applied yourselves to being fulfilling your responsibilities on the council. And I didn't always agree with all of you or many of you, and I still don't agree with much of where we stand. But that's neither here nor there at this point. So Godspeed, and those of you that come back, come back. And those of you who don't come back, who knows? Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Who knows? Well, let's have to wait and see. Uh, anyway, that was about it for the moment. Off the cuff. Thank you. Thanks, George. Other comments? Yes. My name is John and Damien. I live at 86 Waters View Drive. Um, I moved to this town 26 years ago. And um, my comments are off the cuff because, and they're a little different than what I thought I might say if I spoke tonight. Um, I don't come to too many of these meetings. I have served in a number of town committees over those years. Um, it's very educational and interesting to me watching tonight's meeting and watching people's facial expressions. And I guess the one thing that I would hope for more of, especially from the audience, is respect for other people. Um, I mix feelings about the clapping. Some people get loud claps, some get small claps, some get silence. Um, but the part I really was a little surprised by, we're all adults in here, is the smirking after some people talked. Um, I don't care for that. I wasn't sure if I would say anything about the um, development where the fun zone is, but that has been an ugly albatross to this town for so many years. And I do have mixed feelings about the um, tax abatement, but I think in the overall scheme of things, it's going to do wonders for this town. Um, and I support it for that reason. And what I draw my example from, my enthusiasm for it, is having watched what has just recently happened in Rocky Hill um, on, <laughs> I can't remember the name of this, Sunpike, thank you. Seeing that apartment complex go up there and all the stores and the restaurants, um, my understanding is that those apartments were fully rented three months ago. And that's what gives me some confidence that what, happen, what will likely happen here in Wethersfield is going to do the same thing. And you can see the activity taking place all around those apartments in Rocky Hill. So I'm assuming that the same thing is going to happen here. Um, my last comment is that um, I just hope that some more attention will be given going forward to the condition of the roads in this town. Um, just looking at Rocky Hill, and I don't know if they have more money to work with or less money, but the condition of their roads, at least the ones I drive on, is far superior to Wethersfield. Um, and I think that in terms of small things that affect quality of life, the condition of the roads. Um, I would expect that there will be some people of, who are comfortable of an upper income who move into these apartments on the Silas Dean Highway. And perhaps there's plans to fix that road. It's Mill Street. Um, terrible condition terrible condition like many of the other streets in this town and um, that's heck on cars and I hope that gets fixed as part of this whole scheme and thank you for listening to me thank you John and you all did a great job and it's I feel proud of you so good going yeah <clears throat> No, nope, no problem. I don't have my on, but I think I can <laughs> in your direction. I'm Jessica Martin, 431 Church Street. And I just wanted to say two quick things. One is, um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I understand the nuance of the um, need of a staff person to be on a commission in order for it to meet, but I will volunteer to be an unpaid staff person of the town if it means that the Human Rights and Resources Commission could meet. 
and then also when there's a vacancy on that commission, I hope to join Deb Cohen on there. Um, and the other thing is I support, I just green, green light, huge thumbs up on the turning the fun zone into something that's actually fun for the town. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Other public comment? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all the sharing. Council reports. Any council reports this evening? Did we beat you into the ground for an hour and a half? Tony, you have something? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to steal uh, Peter's thunder because he's going to be getting up uh, to speak at, after on economic development. But uh, EDIC did meet last week, and the one thing I just want to bring forward that I don't know if he's going to show it tonight, but uh, they approved at the last meeting a $50,000 uh, facade loan program for 24 Maple Street. It was the former New Britain Candy Company. It's now owned by uh, RestaurantSupply.com. Uh, they're going to be doing multi uh, multiple renovations to that building inside and out. Uh, we saw the schematic of what the outside will look like. Uh, it went be because of being on the other side of the tracks. It did go before the historic district and was approved by them. It's going to do wonders for that portion of Maple Street to enhance things. And from what to, uh, we were told that they're gonna be doing about a half a million dollars in renovations to that building between inside and out, which is uh, also gonna do wonders for our tax base as well. So I just wanted to bring that forward. I'm sure it's in Peter's comments, but I just wanted to thank him for working on that project. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> Other public comments? Okay. Um, Council yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good that I'm finishing up, isn't it? <laughs> um, Council Con. Yeah, Mike. I do. Thank you. Um, there's a few great events this weekend in town. The Keen Carnival. I think many people here and out there volunteered there. It, um, they do great things in the community. It was nice to see it really crowded every night and on Sunday when uh, it was open. Also, during the weekend, Mikey's Place 5K. I think somebody got up there and mentioned that. Um, it was good to see Tony and Polly out there running. Um, <laughs> I try to get you to join us, Mike. I know. <laughs> and then uh, last Sunday, October 8th, I attended the swearing in of two new deputy chiefs on our fire department, Joe Martell and Robert Kelleher. And I want to just congratulate both of them on their new appointments. And lastly, I just want to say that. Um, I did think that the comments made last week were a little disrespectful, and I'm glad to see people kind of come out. Thank you. Comments? Amy? Um, I'd like to take a minute and thank the um, Councilor Hemmen, Deputy Mayor Barry, and Mayor Montaneri for their dedication to the town and years of service on the town council. Um, we've all benefited from your leadership, your uh, institutional knowledge, and you'll be missed on the council. I just want to echo Amy's comments uh, for Paul, Steve, and Donna. The, the, the two things I've come to realize on my first term on the council is that, one, it takes a huge amount of time and sacrifice, um, and I thank you for that. And number two, that you, you truly do, I think, all want to do what's right for the people of Weathersfield, or else you wouldn't be doing this because it would just be a waste of time. So I, I do really want to thank you guys, and I think the whole community should thank you for your <coughs> service. Thank you. Thank you. Tony? Uh, I also want to uh, thank Donna, Paul, and uh, Steve for your years of service uh, to the council. Uh, Paul and Donna, uh, Besides working with you on council, I worked behind the scenes for both of you when I was staff here, providing you with information you needed at the time to get things going. I know the amount of time you've put into this and over the many years, uh, took a lot of time away from your families and all for that. Steve, it's been a short term. You and I have been out for the same amount of time. Uh, thank you for your service too. Uh, I appreciate what you've all done for the uh, taxpayers of Wednesville. Council Connor. Okay. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council, uh, today Moody's, uh, due to the lack of a state budget, has put a negative outlook 
on roughly 30 towns in Connecticut and down in uh, is uh, going to review for downgrade another 26. We are we received the negative outlook, not the downgrade yet, but the rationale is that the amount of cuts the state is looking at under the executive order exceeds our fund balance. So we would be in a negative position. Uh, so Moody's has taken that step of giving the town of Wethersfield a negative outlook for its bonds. So that's a very bad thing. I uh, did reach out to our state representative after receiving that information and pleaded with him to get this done as soon as possible. As you know, the state of Connecticut suffered a downgrade. The city of Hartford suffered a downgrade. MDC, because of the other issues related to the Hartford region and the lack of a state budget, suffered a downgrade. And they are borrowing hundreds of millions of dollars. There is nothing good that comes from this. So the sooner they get a budget, the better off we're all going to be. Um, on your podium this evening is a draft of, a, uh, of comments that the Central Connecticut Solid Waste Authority is going to make on the RFP that's uh, out there from deep to replace the, what's known as the CRA trash facility. Now it's Mira. Um, there are three proposals that deep is reviewing. The details were somewhat um, ambiguous. One's moving the trash to another burn facility, and then the other two proposals had a various new technologies. It did not address tipping fees and, or the economics uh, related to the uh, user municipalities, but these are draft comments that uh, we will probably be endorsing since we are a member of the Solid Waste Authority and they're there for your review. Um, they started stripping paint on the Silas or the uh, Standish House today on the north side. So that project's underway. We should have some good weather to get that done over the next week or so. Uh, hopefully they can make real progress before the weather turns and get that done. And as a, as a side note, I knew nothing about Mr. Cop's TV show. Didn't have anything to do with the TV show. Didn't have anything to do with you not getting a key or otherwise. So I don't know where that comes from, but I had nothing to do with it um, or to doing it in one or the other. So Thanks, John. happy to answer any questions. Peter. Good evening uh, and congratulations to Donna, Steve and Paul. Um, we very much appreciate your service to the town and it's been a pleasure on my behalf to work uh, with all of you over these past few years so good luck in your i don't want to call it retirement but as you move on to other things i'll, I'll be brief i see you have a very lengthy agenda you do have my report for the month of october uh, I, I will just point out a few uh, highlights in terms of uh, New projects or projects that have been completed and new business starts, a couple of uh, highlights to point out to you. Uh, the Beaverbrook Animal Hospital is now open. Um, we will be, we have scheduled a, a ribbon cutting and if you can attend, we would certainly welcome you. Uh, ribbon cutting there on October 26th at noon to celebrate uh, their project. Uh, additionally, I appreciate those of you who attended the uh, ribbon cutting at Chipotle restaurant, which opened recently. We have another ribbon cutting scheduled on uh, October 24th at noon uh, at uh, 1866 Berlin Turnpike. That's El Pollo Guapo, uh, the chicken restaurant. If you haven't been in there, please stop by. Uh, I can guarantee you will uh, enjoy uh, the food there. Uh, 1025 Silas Dean Highway just this past weekend, uh, Hartford Healthcare opened up a new urgent care facility uh, at that location. There are other things in that list, but I won't go into those given uh, your time constraints. In terms of projects under construction right now, um, the River Cafe at 100 Great Meadow Road is uh, making great progress, and we're hoping to see that open up with the outside seating deck on the Connecticut River uh, very shortly. Uh, if you've been up to Ridge Road, 275 Ridge Road, uh, the the 60-unit uh, apartment building up there is uh, now framing. I think they're up on the second floor. So uh, if, if you get a chance, pull in there and take a look at the progress there. Uh, I spoke to a couple of the counselors in the last week or so, but 1770 Berlin Turnpike, the foreman Carmen Anthony's restaurant, was recently sold. And is, if you've been by there, it's now under renovation. It will be opened up at some point in the future as another restaurant. 
uh, Ascot Catering down on Main Street uh, is uh, working inside. They are planning on opening up a, a new venture in there with prefer prepared foods and a takeout restaurant. So uh, that will be, uh, another, it seems to, seems to be all food that I'm talking about today. Um, another food uh, item, 1142 Silestine Highway in the Marshalls Plaza. We're very happy to announce that Pasta Vida uh, we'll be opening up there. I don't think they'll probably be able to open up until after the new year. They've got extensive renovations there, but a great addition uh, to the town. In terms of uh, projects that are coming down the road, uh, obviously you'll be talking about the Borden uh, a little bit later on the agenda. Uh, I will be staying here if you have any questions of me that I can answer. Um, we're also happy to announce that Weathersfield Shopping Center, they are planning on starting work on two new businesses. K Jewelers is moving in there and Ulta Beauty. Uh, they will be also doing a, a pretty substantial facade improvement uh, at the shopping center. So once again, we're pretty happy about that. And as Tony mentioned at the last EDIC meeting, uh, the town approved uh, some additional facade money for the former New Britain Candy Company building. Restaurant Supply will be going in there and uh, they've indicated an investment of about a half a million dollars, probably about 30 employees. So once again, some, some good news. Um, also, it's not in my report, uh, 207 Church Street, which is the former Clearinghouse Auction Gallery, sold last Thursday, um, I think to a similar group that was working on the previous project. So uh, we'll keep you posted as that goes forward. Tomorrow at four o'clock, we have a ribbon cutting at Cove Deli. So if you can join us uh, there, uh, we would uh, welcome you. Uh, so at four o'clock in the afternoon, a couple of other plugs on October 26th, the deadline for the uh, tourism photo contest. Uh, so that's the fifth year we've done that. So if you are a photographer and you'd like to submit an entry, please uh, reach out to us and we'll tell you how to do that. And then lastly, uh, if you'd like to mark your calendar, the annual salute to business at the country club is scheduled for December 13th. Be happy to answer any of your questions. I hope I was uh, as brief as I could Thank be. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate the brevity on it. Certainly. Given the schedule. Questions for Peter? I did get a question from somebody on the Princeton Street, the four lot subdivision. Yes. Do you know what's going on with that? Uh, Princeton Street is a, a road that dates back to, believe it or not, 1918. It was plotted out with uh, a number of other streets down there. Um, they went through the Planning and Zoning Commission process pretty recently. We approved four building lots in there. They will be building a through road, through street. Um, they were planning on starting by now, but it looks like they probably won't start till next year. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Mike Rell and then Jody. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just a quick question on Weathersfield Automotive, new owner. That is where most people in the area go to get Emissions. Emissions, done. yes. Is that going to be affected at all? No. They still plan on. No, he's still it doing it now under the new ownership. Uh, I don't know if you know Greg Lyshatz. He is now the new proprietor of Weathersfield okay. Automotive. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. Joke. Mine's easy. Are you allowed to tell us which restaurant's going to be moving in to where the old Carmen Anthony's is? <laughs> he has, uh, it's, the, it's an owner operator. He has not told us. Uh, the name of his restaurant he's going to do it himself actually so it'll be a locally owned and operated restaurant not a chain okay we wish him all all the luck in the world <laughs> you know how tough restaurants are so yeah. I, I would just echo a plug uh Ipo il guapo on the Berlin turnpike the food is absolutely incredible uh, so <laughs> folks who want to go uh, i happen to go to an, uh, a catered event a very large event and they handled that as well so very uh if you if you're right familiar place. if you're familiar with the Mercado food truck that you may see around in Hartford and also at the farmers market, it's the young couple, so they're branching into a you know a, a, an actual location on the ground. So, great stuff. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Peter, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay, we can move into regular business. I do not think we have any uh, ordinances or appointments or any unfinished business that's coming off the table. We'll move to, to uh, other business. I'm just gonna move 3B up quick because it's a fairly quick item and then we'll go into 3A. So if we could move the motion on 3B, please. Sure, I'll move to take it out of order. Yes. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Can I get a motion? Sure, uh, ma'am, I'd like to make a motion to approve the request of the Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce 
for a beer garden for the 2017 Holidays on Main event <coughs> contingent upon their arrangements and permits with the police department and liquor authorities. Second. Motion is second. Jeff? Uh, pretty self-explanatory. They had a beer garden at the last Holidays on Main event and they would like to repeat this year. Uh, they do have the process and program in place, so it's just an, just an annual request. So we would support that. Very good. Questions about that from council? Really straightforward. If you have tickets left over from last year, can you bring them this year? <laughs> no. no. Oh. Can you get a half a beer for the other color? <laughs> no, I'm kidding you, Leslie. We good with that? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Now we can go to 3A. Motion to approve the tax incentive for the board and development project located at 1178 Silestein Highway. Per the recommendation of the tax incentive program review committee and a contingent upon a final incentive agreement effectuating the approved incentive being developed and approved by the town attorney and town manager. Second. Motion is second. Jeff, we have a brief presentation, I think. Yes, uh, I'll just go through some background and then we'll turn it over to Mr. Kenny to do his uh, brief presentation. On, uh, the town of Wethersfield has adopted, as Peter O'Keefe said, back in January of 2004, a tax incentive program which would allow the council to abate a certain percentage of taxes on new improvements on a property as an incentive to locate a business. As it says in section four of the uh, policy that the only reason the council would do this is if it would result in a business relocating or expanding in the town of Wethersfield. Uh, so on September 13, 2017, the developers of the Borden filed an application with the town manager's office requesting a tax incentive per the town's incentive program for aid in the de redevelopment of 1178 Silestine Highway, also known as the Fun Zone. The proposed development is a mixed residential and commercial uh, use project, uh, 11, 111 market rate apartments, two real retail spaces on the first of five floors. <coughs> Total estimated uh, cost of the project is $28 million. The, uh, the tax incentive policy uh, has a incentive committee that consists of the town manager, the finance director, the economic development director, the town assessor, and a member of the EDIC, which in this instance was the chairman, Mark Trahan. And he has a statement that I will read into the record prior to the end of my comments. Um, that committee met with the developer uh, after the uh, application was submitted, and then that committee met a, s a couple more times, and over those meetings, we clarified the needs of the developer, looked at the financing program that the uh, developers put together, looked at the needs of the town, and at the conclusion is now recommending a six-year abatement uh, be granted to the project. The six-year abatement uh, does, two th it does several things. First, it provides relief uh, in the form uh, up front when uh, the project is just starting and per the information provided by the developer, uh, the ramp up period is greater than one year. So the first two years are 100% in order to get the business established. And then a sliding scale of 70, 50, 40, and 30% thereafter. Uh, total abatement period is six years. Uh, now, Prior to the certificate of occupancy during the construction period, the developer will pay the current taxes that are on the property. That is a requirement of the program that all existing taxes levied will continue to be paid through the abatement period, and the abatement is only on the new construction. And that is part of the agreement with the developer. Um, so under the policy, the uh, committee is making its recommendation to the council uh, of a particular incentive package and the council uh, can take the action it deems on it. Um, Mr. Trahan has given me a statement. I'm gonna read it into the record. It's not here. Um, Mr. Jeff Bridges, Weathersfield Town Manager. As you know, I serve as the chairman of the Economic Development Improvement Commission, and in that role, also sit on the Tax Abatement Review Committee. I would ask that this brief letter be read into the record and distributed to the council. In a nutshell, regarding the proposed tax abatement we have, the fun zone, which is a highly visible and blighted property that has been vacant for over 20 years. The developer, a resident of Wethersfield who has an excellent track record with projects similar to the Borden and Hartford, Glastonbury, Bloomfield, and Windsor. 
a project that brings much needed housing to attract and keep taxpayers in Wethersfield, a project which is proposed could end up being the jewel of the Southstein Highway. The tax abatement from an inv investment perspective will yield over the coming decades millions of dollars to support the growing community and infrastructure of Wethersfield. Considering the state of Connecticut's current financial status, this abatement can be viewed as a critical proactive step for Wethersfield to be more fiscally self-reliant and less dependent on the state long term. This proposed tax abatement, if passed by the council, also signals to other developers that Wethersfield is open for business and is willing to partner with projects that make sense to the community of the taxpayers of Wethersfield. I hope the entire council sees this tax abatement request for what it is, low risk, high reward, seed money for the future growth of the town of Wethersfield. I am extremely thankful to the entire council and its leadership for their time and hard work. Make the fun zone fun again. Mark Trahan, Chairman, EDIC 21, Robinswood Drive. Um, those are my comments. I'll ask Mr. Kenny, who's here this evening, and his associate to kind of give a brief overview of the project. Uh, it is passed through all the planning and zoning requirements, Peter. So there we go. Good evening, for the record. Uh, my name is Peter Alter. I practice law in Glastonbury and have worked with Marty Kenny uh, through the inception to the uh, present state of the board. And we've provided you with uh, a rendering of what the board will look like from the Silestine Highway as it was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, earlier this year. To give a little background, uh, as has been indicated, Marty has lived in Wethersfield for a long time and, and is very committed to bringing a quality project to the Silestine Highway. The inception of his concept for uh, this property really arose from the document that was adopted as the Silestine Vision Plan uh, by this community, where it is uh, spelled out exactly what Weathersfield wants for the Silestine Highway, specifically to foster development of mixed uses, to create transitional higher density residential housing, to create an impetus for further neighborhood commercial expansion, and provide an appropriate transition from lower density residential neighborhoods to the commercial corridor, and to create uh, an opportunity for reinvestment in a property that has long been vacant and, and stagnant. Uh, people have referred to it as an eyesore and an albatross, and certainly it qualifies for all those definitions. In addition, uh, Marty's vision for this property brings a streetscape element to the Silasine Highway. Uh, it provides access management by an arrangement and agreement with 1160, the old equity bank building, so that uh, this property will have access out to Mill Street, um, and it adopts the architectural guidelines that were spelled out pretty clearly uh, by virtue of the, the vision plan for the Silestine Highway. Um, Mr. Gillespie's office worked very closely with us and, and guided us through some of the opportunities. We had a great deal of review and input from the Architectural Design Review Committee as well as the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, as indicated, uh, this is a mixed use, 111 residential units ranging from studio apartments up to three bedroom apartments. A um, couple of items I do want to correct uh, with respect to the tannery. I was also involved in that project with Marty. Uh, we did not seek uh, tax abatement uh, of any kind from the town of Glastonbury. That project is 250 units. Uh, and uh, a large-scale restaurant as well. And the economy of scale of that uh, property and the opportunity for development is completely different than the one uh, presented here. The economics are different, although even with that project, Marty did receive uh, assistance from the state of Connecticut in the form of loans uh, in order to uh, move that project forward. This project, as indicated, is about a $28 million project. It will produce between 150 and 200 construction jobs over the course of the construction of this project. And at the end of it, will produce anywhere from 30 to 50 full-time jobs 
uh, for the retail sector that uh, will be developed on the first floor of the property. The property has its own challenges. Um, we have an existing building with environmental issues that will have to be addressed uh, through remediation as the, as the property is, as the building is raised. Those of you who've been on the property know it is substantially below the grade of Silestine Highway, and uh, the property is going to have to be filled uh, in order for this development to take the appearance that, that is expected on the Silestine. We uh, have established a permanent relationship with 1160 Silestine, which requires Marty to undertake substantial renovation of that parking lot to repopulate it with landscaping and to make it far more attractive visually uh, from Mill Street than it is now uh, and to integrate that into uh, this project so that it looks like a cohesive uh, element all the way from Mill Street to uh, Goff Brook. Part of what Marty had to do was to undertake to protect the Goff Brook Valley uh, in, in moving forward with this development. Uh, somebody mentioned Mill Street as an issue. Part of this project requires some widening on Mill Street. And I don't I apologize if the council is aware of the MDC project that is going to undertake a complete renovation of its system within Mill Street. So that at the end of Marty's work on Mill Street, the MDC's work on Mill Street, and the town's work on Mill Street, it will be completely reconstructed and will, in fact, be uh, much more uh, passable and appropriate than it is right now, providing extra turning opportunities uh, as well. So this project, in our mind, meets all of the expectations that uh, were had in the Silestine vision for reinvestment plan. It meets all the standards high standards that Mr. Gillespie made us aware of as we brought this project through uh, for approval. A couple of other highlights will be a rooftop deck available for residents, a restaurant with outside dining uh, at the uh, front corner of the property to, to be attractive to passers-by, and again, as I indicated, an integration of two sites so that they'll work together uh, as a unified body and, and present exactly what the Silestine vision plan uh, contemplates in, in tying properties together. Uh, and I completely agree with the assessment that this building is designed to be iconic and will be iconic for the Silestine Highway. Uh, and I can certainly attest to the other projects that Marty has been involved with where uh, they stimulate growth not only by attracting young residents uh, to an area, but also by stimulating other businesses to provide services to those new residents. Well, Marty is here. He's happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but that's the brief overview of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Marty or if you are there here? Don? Um, a couple things. Um, one, I have some questions. I tried to read through um, the packet as best I could, considering we just got it um, Thursday night, and because it's a lot of information. But if you could explain to me a little bit more about, I tried to read through the, the methodology for the public school, estimating the or an, analyzing the um, data for the public school children. If you could just help me understand that a little bit better as to how that came about. We have the uh, author of that here, and he's best equipped to answer it, I think. This is Don Poland. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Donald Poland. I am a uh, managing director and urban planner with Gilman York based in East Hartford, uh, Main Street, and also a Weathersfield High graduate. Uh, in regard to the public school calculations, the methodology consisted of a few approaches. One was to first and foremost 
take a look at the number of public school age children being generated by the existing housing stock and take a look at the characteristics of the existing housing stock, which is predominantly single family, three bedroom or more, which generates, tends to generate the highest amount of school age children. I then utilized the Rutgers uh, study from 2006, which is the best and most recent data we have on the generation of uh, number of school age children generated by new housing construction uh, over a 10 year study period that they looked at to come up with essentially multipliers to make the determination based on the unit mix, studio ones, twos, and three bedroom units, how many students would be generated, potentially generated by the Borden. That data showed approximately 16 school age children. However, based on other studies we've conducted, based on the fact that the demographic structure of households continues to change, meaning that single person households are becoming more and more common, the number of children we are having is becoming less and less and so forth. My estimates to calculate the projections were that the 111 units would generate approximately eight school age children. Now there's a qualifying statement in the report, I believe in two locations, in the sense that even though I worked in those actual costs of eight school age children to the fiscal impact on the town, my true belief is that the fiscal impact would be zero in the sense that the town has contracted its enrollments in the public school system over the past six years have contracted by 115 students. And I would see that trend continuing in the near future and a slow climb back, uh, therefore absorbing either eight or 16, if I use the full multiplier, uh, into 13 grades, that's K through 12, would essentially have zero impact on the education budget. You're not gonna be hiring new teachers or putting school expansion projects in the works because you've already seen a contraction for one, but just those numbers of students spread over 13 grades wouldn't have an impact. Okay, that does help. I read through it and it was, it helped me to hear it. <laughs> Understood, there's a lot of words there <laughs> trying to explain it. It was a lot of information throughout the whole report. And then just Paul, if I may, one more comment. Um, and I know it isn't really a direct impact to the project, but just a concern, and I've expressed this over the last several months related to the state budget, not knowing what our revenues would be, could be, are, for the, at least for the 2018 um, fiscal year. And um, with the governor's release today, um, did ask the question, you know, what would the impact of his projection, knowing that it's not enacted by the legislature, but that it's still, um, out there for discussion, it was um, 1.1 million to the town a loss. So, I mean, that's a significant dollar loss. And it, it's, I understand that it's a separate consideration, but in my mind, we're not gonna be in any better place next year or the year after from the state perspective. So just trying to struggle forward with where the town is going to be from that perspective, I think we're not gonna see that go away. Um, and, and so my comment is more related to the length of time for the abatement. I'm not against a tax incentive. It makes per perfect sense to me. But I'm just looking at the potential length of time of that impact because of other extenuating um, factors that I see. And that's just my own comment. Thank Thanks you, for your help answering the other question. Other comments here? Jody? I just wanted some clarification. I think, Jeff, when you were reading through some of the numbers, you had said that the, during the construction, there will still be the current taxes paid. That's correct. And then it goes up from there. Yeah, the, the, during construction, will freeze their current taxes. I think it's at $46,900. It's what they pay now. Um, and rather than tinker with the assessment because they're going to demolish the building and build a new one, mm -hmm. we lock in the taxes as they are now through construction once there's a certificate of occupancy issued. Then there's a two year at that same number. So 
during construction it's 46.9 post construction for the first two it's 46.9 then you see the abatement fall off based upon the value of the new improvements okay so we don't lose anything right. we just don't but we do gain during the time after occupancy as you're getting the personal property getting the motor vehicle you're getting those other growth in our revenue as the abatement di dissipates mm -hmm. You'll also receive substantial permit fees at the outset when the project starts. Mm -hmm. Those will be, we estimate, about $250,000. Mm -hmm. Those are the construction permits? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. My only other question, I don't know who can answer it, is we um, obviously know that there was $5 million commitment from the state through DECD. Now, I understand the bonding commission approved that, but it has not been released yet. Is that in any jeopardy because of what's going on in Hartford? No. Uh, you have a letter dated yesterday indicating that the $5 million is in place and will stay in place. That's very good news. Thank you for investing in our town, your town. Other questions for Marty or Anthony? Yeah, my, my questions are, I think, for Marty based on more process than anything else. Um, with respect to the timing of this, because I know some people have commented on the timing, and obviously it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's, there's an election coming up. People can make it whatever they want. Um, my understanding is that some weeks ago, uh, some of the Republican counselors and maybe the chairman of the Republican Party met with you about this development. Is that right? I met with both Democrats and Republicans on this to discuss the merits of the tax abatement. In the particular meeting I'm talking about, I'm talking about Representative Hurley, Rel, the chairman of the Republican Party, and maybe Stathis Manusos. Yes. Did a meeting with them? Yes. And my understanding of that meeting is that somehow my name came up in that meeting. Is that right? No. Okay. Um, throughout the course of that meeting, um, were you encouraged at all uh, to delay this <coughs> project? That, that idea came up, yes. Okay. And was it also um, spoken to you that if you were to delay it, you may have the Republicans' um, endorsement, but maybe not at this time? I, how is that germane to what we're talking about? I, well, I'm asking the questions. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So was that conveyed to you? Um, yes. Okay. Um, were there several other meetings with that group of people? No. Okay. Are you aware of a conversation that happened with your partner in this development and that group of people? No. Okay. I think that's all I have. Thank you. I was, go ahead, Mike. Oh, no. I was just going to make a comment in, in, in favor of the, uh, uh, of this proposal. As many people have said, um, this is a win-win-win for the town. Looking at it from uh, thinking that it's costing the town 1.1 or 1.6 or whatever is not looking at it in the right way because there is no money being expended by the town. Um, again, I think Sean Duffy came up and said what is happening is we are ultimately asking the developer not um, to pay taxes during the early phases of this project. But as of this point, we have a blighted property that we're only getting $46,000 a year for. Um, over the course of the first seven years of the project, we'll, uh, even with the abatement, it will generate over a million dollars in real estate taxes. That's not including the personal property taxes. That's not including the motor vehicle taxes of all the residents that live in this building, um, the construction permit fees. Um, this is truly a long-term home run for the town. Um, and there is no reason to delay. This uh, has been pending for well over, uh, well over a year. The concept probably goes back two or three years. Um, it, it's been a lot of work. It's been through planning and zoning. It's been through inland wetlands. There, this has been a completely open process, and it's been, and it's a win-win. Uh, quoting Mark Trahan, um, 
Well, I won't quote him because I don't have his comments in front. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, what he said was it's low risk, high reward, um, and seed money for the future financial growth of Weathersfield. It's, it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer. We should act on it tonight, and we should get this done. Mike Rowe. Um, thank you. Uh, Marty, thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, having a homegrown uh, developer is uh, always a plus when you're looking at economic development. Um, just to answer Anthony's question, I, I wish you would come to me and to Mike with those concerns rather than you know, voicing it into a public um, uh, arena to a, to a developer. I would have been happy to tell you that we did meet with uh, Marty to talk about um, the plan. Um, I had heard from uh, Paul over the summer, and that was all I had heard about the program or about the, uh, um, the project and the possibility of a tax abatement. It was brought up. Um, in the P and D uh, or uh, P and Z meeting uh, about the possibility of a tax abatement, but we had never heard of anything. Um, I was you know, appreciative that Paul did call uh, over the summer, uh, but after that call, we did not hear anything from um, uh, the council, uh, uh, P and Z economic development. Uh, so we had some questions about the, uh, the program. Um, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This town went through two years ago um, a little bit of humiliation when we were um, suggesting to have uh, the Weight Watchers building uh, taken down and Ashley Furniture come in. Um, I did not want to see this council go through that again. I didn't want to see the public go through that again. Um, to this day, talking to folks, they still comment to me about Ashley Furniture and why it didn't come. And I have to tell them point blank, you know, I don't really know. I wasn't privy to those conversations. I was not privy to those discussions. I wasn't privy to some of the discussions about this uh, uh, development coming into town. So we reached out to the uh, to the de uh, developer to get additional questions answered. Um, to that point, and to the point of other people coming up and saying that this could be politically motivated, doing something like this so close to an election. You know, I sat right there, front row, two years ago, three days before election, and I saw members of uh, the council and candidates shaking hands with the developer of the soon-to-be Ashley Furniture pro Project. Three days before an election is one thing. I mean, that's pretty quick. And then to turn around and see it in our mailboxes the next day, and then be humiliated on social media because I questioned how fast somebody could turn around a mailer and put it in mailboxes about a project that has been in the works for a while or had not been in work, excuse me, for a while, had only been, you know, shaken on the day before. Here we are, we're given a little bit benefit of the doubt of, you know, three weeks notice and not three days notice. And I do appreciate that. But it is questionable, the timing before an election, to put out a project, whether good or bad, and I'll let that be the, you know, have your own thoughts on that, about putting something to the public just before an election. Um, I still have not made up my mind whether or not to support something like this. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that to see Weathersfield prosper, we need economic development in this town. I do question timing. I also do question, like Donna did, about the lack of a state budget right now. There's a lot going on up in Hartford. <laughs> Take that back. There's a lot not going on up in Hartford right now. Too many unknowns, too many questions. The budget that came out today, governor's fourth budget, I believe, and it's questionable what he's doing with DECD funds, but there is a question of whether or not 
The CRDA funds will be available. And this is, if I'm not mistaken, a CRDA project, not a DECD project? That's correct. That's not correct. Those right. funds came from the State Bond Commission uh, on September 30th, 1916. We're involved in what's going on now. 2016. Um, the, the, yeah, 2016. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was uh, something else. Get some interest on that. Um, <clears throat> so CRDA was asked to manage these funds because DECD's only other housing arm is the Department of Housing that usually deals with low-income housing projects. So they felt that Mike Freemuth and his team at CRDA was much more equipped to deal with those funds, so they were named to manage that uh, process. Okay. Okay. So the the five million is still safe. Yes. I mean, I think uh, your attorney said it as well. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> additionally, I mean, just thinking about some of the things with regard to the possible downgrade. It, that is a bad thing. I mean, Jeff said it was a bad thing. Um, not knowing whether or not our bond rating will be um, kept intact uh, in the next couple of weeks, whether or not we would get state funding, uh, ECS fund cuts, uh, they're all unknowns right now. Um, so you know, we have some serious decision making to do up here. I mean, it's not as easy as simply saying, yes, we do this and we'll see the, you know, shovels in the ground tomorrow. Um, what we need to realize is that we, while we might say yes to a project like this where there would be tax incentives, we might have to say no to something else later on because of lack of <coughs> state funds. And right now, um, I just don't think the timing of this is correct for us to put this out there to the public. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Just, I, I just want to comment on one, a couple of things. Uh, first, Marty, thank you for years of uh, work on this. Um, I'm not sure who has the tougher spot, you guys, or some of the stuff that we got to do to get it done. But, um, you know, I appreciate as a Weathersfield resident that you've stepped up. You and I have had several conversations about wrestling you to the table to make this happen and I appreciate you put yourself out there financially if I'm not mistaken I think there's over a quarter million dollars of investment in this if it doesn't happen that's just kind of lost which I'm sure you've experienced in your time unfortunately so I want to thank you for that and for the commitment to Weathersfield um, that's just the third party payees by the way yeah <laughs> yeah I'm sure um, I, I do want to address the the concern, uh, sort of the elephant in the room, I guess, with respect to Weight Watchers and two years ago and how that impacts making a decision tonight, which uh, I do appreciate that point, Mike. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago when we I had worked on the Weight Watchers with uh, Jeff was a little involved, Peter was a little involved, we, we worked for about nine months on getting that letter of agreement and purchase agreement signed by Ashley and we were working with the owner of Weight Watchers, uh, and, and yes, the timing was right near the election, of course. And when we signed it, you know, I remember thinking this is a, such an important victory for the town to get another building that's been blighted uh, agreed to. And um, I, I will share, it was, it's, it's very humbling to not have that go through. Um, and, and I will also share honestly that in the zealousness to get that out there and champion the success for Weathersfield. Um, we obviously ran the ad, um, we put it out there, and, and candidly, you know, all of us that elect or seek election and run and work, it's, it's, it's not good to have that happen and have it fail and feel that that was genuinely in, in the interest of the town. And, and so I, I know how you guys feel about that. I think Mike Hurley particularly has shared it. Um, and so, in August when I reached out to you, Mike, I want to add one piece to the narrative. Um, I knew that that failure of that to go through left bitter feelings. And I shared with Mike, I pledged to him then, and I also gave my word to Marty that we would not do anything with this politically if it went through, uh, that we would not run an ad, we would not champion it as part of the campaign. Um, 
and and candidly you know this is a little personal for me i worked on this thing for three and a half years um but i i wanted to concede that point to you mike and hopefully you shared it with your colleagues because i want this project so desperately to go through for this town and i want us to share it and i think if i remember paraphrasing our call i said let's let's do it together let's get up together say that we got this done together that it was a bipartisan effort that we have a 9-0 vote on this abatement and that we could all take credit and we would not take credit for it as a party during the election the timing was not in our control on this marty i'm sure can share the long long months to get it through p and z and wetlands and i knew it was getting closer and closer i would have loved to have this done back in april it wasn't meant to be so i just want to be sure and I hope you'll agree that I shared that with you and was sincere in telling you that we would not run it. And I pledge it again if we pass this, that this is not a campaign issue. This is not an election issue. This is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic win. It's a win for our town. We so desperately need this project to happen. And, and so I, I publicly take responsibility for probably being overzealous with Weight Watchers. That was a real deal that was signed that I believed was going to happen. And we spent another six months with the developer and the owner trying to make the contract work with the construction and it didn't happen. And I'll, I'll take personal responsibility for working and seeing that fail. And in retrospect, if I had known all the steps that would be needed for it to be real, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have been out there in front of it. And that's why I'm saying this isn't even done. We sit here tonight on October 16th and this is not done. Even if you guys are with us and we vote on this together and we get it done, I'm sure Maya can tell you six things that can go wrong in the next 60 days. It's not done. But we sure as hell owe Weathersfield to try to make it happen. And so you have my word again. Marty has had my word on this. This is not political. Please join us. Let's do this together. Let's pass this abatement. We all, and frankly, I think you guys definitely agree with this project. Nobody's going to disagree with this project. And probably down in your hearts, you agree the abatement's got to happen. I get the economy. I get the stuff that's going on with the state. Everybody understands what we're facing. But it, it's more important than ever that we do this because it helps us five, six years out combat the very problems we're facing. And, and let me say one other point about the state government budget. The budget in the state is in a shambles. We're probably going to take some hits. But the state of Connecticut is not going to stop putting state police on the road. It's not going to stop paving roads. It's not going to stop staffing their prisons. And I have a different philosophy about our economy in tough times. My philosophy is you keep working harder at economic development because hopefully you turn it around. I think you guys are more cautious by nature. That's fine. We have different philosophies on that. But Weathersfield stands tonight to support a project which still has some hurdles to get done and to do so in a bipartisan spirit because it's in the best interest of the state and hope that this stuff works for us four or five years from now. Hope it gets us stimulation of economic development. I know a guy signed a lease agreement the other day on the, on the hope that this is going to happen across the street and is going to watch if this passes and he's going to put money in the game. So it will stimulate those other things. So please understand my sincere interest in saying to you, I don't want this to be political. I want us to do this together and champion it together. And the papers can say we did it together. And Weathersfield's leadership on its last night, my last night as an elected official, come with me. Let's do this together. It's not going to be in campaigns. It's not going to be in ads. It's not going to be in a mailer. It's going to be in the newspaper talking about how this council leads this state with bipartisan good decisions. So I, I sincerely ask for that from you. Just to um, follow up, and thank you, Paul. I mean, I did say that, you know, we did have that conversation. And part of the other, my end of the conversation was that if you are going to do something, let's hold off until after the election to do it. Um, let's give, I forget who mentioned it, but somebody mentioned, let's give the this next council an opportunity to weigh in on this. Um, I do appreciate you uh, saying that you're not going to make it political. Um, it's tough, you know, coming from somebody who got burned in so social media posts from campaign consultants. Um, it's tough not to, to take it um, on the chin. Um, and what you mentioned with Ashley Furniture, and you know, you, you had mentioned that you worked a little bit with uh, Jeff and a little bit with um, Peter. You didn't work anything with us, though. 
that's the biggest concern that I had with that project. <laughs> and this project as well, again, going back to what Anthony had questioned, we had questions about this. Um, we weren't privy to some of the discussions that were going on. You know, we are a body of nine. We have four of the nine, not quite the majority, but we do have a voice up here. We do represent people up here. And um, while we may differ on some issues, we do get along about 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, and uh, you know, just having a seat at the table or uh, a privy to some of the additional discussions that were going on post our conversation in August um, would have been appreciative. I, I mean, I'm well, just saying I that say, Mike, I, I haven't had a single conversation about this since you and I talked that involved any negotiation or debate. I saw the abatement request as Marty got it drafted for the first time on September 13th and the town got it. I didn't participate in the abatement design. It's not appropriate for me to be involved with debatement design. Um, you know, certainly all the P and Z and wetlands meetings, I sat home and watched them on TV. That's how I learned about it. It's not really appropriate for me as mayor to interfere with any of that. The role that I've tried to play, and this was true with Weight Watchers and it's true with uh, Marty on this project is kind of cha champion and, and, and cheerleading. It's not negotiating. Some of the negotiation with Weight Watchers we were involved with, and I think I shared this with you last year or two years ago, that, that it was confidential. They made, made us sign confidentiality agreements, not to share the terms. Um, so it wasn't like we could go to the council and say, well, guys, we have this thing going on, and we hope it's going to come together, and here's the terms. We couldn't. And it isn't disrespectful to you, and it wasn't disrespectful to the Democrats on the council at the time that I didn't share it with. And in fact, I imagine some of my Democratic colleagues would say, we don't really know a lot about this abatement thing. What's going on? We were having that discussion this week. Again, because it's unfolding before our eyes. And as a council, we have an obligation to let them take the path. And we have, elect we have professionals who saw this. We have Peter, EDIC, uh, Fauna, who's here from the tax assessor, obviously our, our full-time manager who are making those decisions. And it's not appropriate for us to participate as a council on that because it's gotta be neutrally evaluated. So it's not political. So it's not like we're championing something. So, you know, I get that, I understand it. But um, I, I'm gonna remind you again, Mike, that yes, the issue with uh, the, the mailing and all that kind of stuff, it, it's an election kind of thing. It's, it's been done, it's been hashed, I've discussed it. But it was all in good faith to get that done. It didn't happen. I take responsibility for being overzealous about it. <coughs> But there, one thing I want to reiterate again, it was a signed agreement that we worked for another six months on. We brought in two contractors. In fact, Marty was kind enough to introduce me to a contractor who was willing to trim it as tight as possible to make Weight Watchers happen. And we spent a month with him going through the building. And as we went through the building, we saw so many more problems than anybody was aware of were in that building to, to be saved. So Ashley got cold feet and they pulled back. So it wasn't for lack of trying and it wasn't trying to score against this versus that. It was really what's important for the town. So I do understand how you, how you feel about that. I understand how Mike Hurley felt about it when he voiced it. But we got to get past that and not let us drag down here tonight on this, which is far farther along, far more advanced. And we've been so careful to not politicize it. And again, tonight we sit here. This is not a political event. Nobody's going to get burned on this. The only one that's going to get burned on this is the town of Wethersfield if we let what's happened interfere with making a good decision. And, and I hope we can do it 9-0 because it sends a strong message to Marty in the days ahead when he's gonna be facing some stuff that he might need us to be in his court. It's gonna string a strong message that we've put that aside, we've worked together. It shouldn't go on to the next council. How do we know who this is gonna be on the next council? Why would we put that in their hands? They haven't participated and yes, you know, Deputy Mayor said to me when we were talking about this week, you know, this is kind of personal for you. Well, it is. It is. I worked hard on it. I want it to happen. Not for me personally. It's personal because I care about this town and I'm finished with my term. This is my last meeting and I want to get it done. Not for politics, for Wethersfield. And I know you guys feel the same way about that. So let's put that aside. Let's move past it. Let's agree that what's done is done from two years ago, but let's not jeopardize this. This is too huge, too important. Yeah. Just, just a quick comment, uh, really in response to to Mike, one, um, and, and Donna a little bit as well. Um, whether the state gives us zero, whether they give us 10 million, that doesn't affect whether this is a good project for the town of Wethersfield. The point is, this abatement 
and this project will bring in millions of dollars over the long haul to the town of Wethersfield. The reason that's important is it will reduce the taxes for all people in town. I mean, that's the goal. You want to expand your base. You want to expand development. You want to encourage growth. So if the state gives us zero or if they give us 10 million, that doesn't change that this is a good project that should be acted on now. It's before us. We should deal with it. Um, the other issue uh, um, with, with Ashley Furniture, the one thing I would say is um, uh, there are two philosophies. And I know when we talked about development in past years, um, my belief is that in order to develop the town, you have to be aggressive. You have to let people know that, that we want people to come. You have to be out there pounding the pavement. And I heard a number of times in past years that, listen, let the market work. It'll take care of itself. Well, the reality is, in order to make things work, you have to be aggressive. You have to work at it. And, and, and to be honest, that's something that, that our mayor has done, um, done capably. Does that mean that you're going to win every time? No. If, if you try, there are times you're not going to succeed. But over the long haul, it's best for trying and keep working and let people know that, that the town is open for, for development, encourages development, and wants to work with development. So yes, there will be failures along the way. But just because it was a failure doesn't mean it was, was, uh, was about politics. So that's my own comment, commentary on that. So. Tony. Uh, I just want to add on to some of what Steve said. I mean, there's concerns out there because we don't know where things are with the state, how we're going to end up with the state. Uh, we may take losses on it. We might get gains. Who knows? That's to be determined. But the one thing we know about this party and I, this project, and I want to thank Marty for it, is we know during the two years of construction, we're going to continue to receive the tax base we currently get. If we take a reduction from the state in income, we're gaining more revenues by this project because during the two years that Marty's building this building, we're bringing in, like he said, $250,000 in uh, building permits. That's going to offset some of the loss that we're going to get if we take a loss from the state. So this is a win-win for us. And as a fellow resident, Marty, I thank you for doing what you're doing to help keep us whole. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay. I had some questions oh, on the project. Um, and I don't know. We're well past question. Well, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I know it sounds like we are. No, but go ahead. I don't think go we ahead. are. Of course. Um, and I don't know if this is for Jeff or I think it might be for Marty. Um, and we've talked about a few of these things before. But I was looking at some of the calculations on the taxes on the the cars. Um, it looks like every car that parks there, it looked like was calculated as taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're the guy who did the calculations. Steve? Yeah. Okay, good. Please calculation man. Okay. Uh, so just I'll just give you a brief. A brief sure. Uh, so I, I read great. the calculations. I've talked to Marty and I've talked to people about the project, and I do agree it could be a great project to have. Um, but talking to people, it was like people from Weathersfield were gonna, you know, we'll have some kids moving in from Weathersfield, maybe from Rocky Hill some young people kind of moving in. So I thought maybe the car taxes should be maybe like cut down, especially in the exhibit itself, because all we're doing is taking car taxes from my house, 76 Black Birch, and then moving it down there for some of them. I didn't see a calculation like that. And then also, if we're gonna take a existing business and maybe move it over there, you really can't count those taxes as incremental taxes. Well, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. Uh, one is, it, yeah, you, you're right to some extent. There may be a shuffling around of people. So the new person moving from Rocky Hill or from Glastonbury into town, that would be a new car tax. If you move from your address to the Borden and I counted you there, I have to make the assumption that someone moved in and filled in your address and most likely they have a car. So my, I'm using the best data possible. You have parking standards and your zoning regs as a number of parking spaces required. It says X number of vehicles will be here. And I make a calculation based on that. And usually factor in some common sense to it on past experience and so forth and come up with that number. Is it possibly lower based on the circumstance you said? Yes. 
Is it possibly higher if you had a lot of people come in from out of town, out of state? Yes. Uh, or could it potentially be more than what it is? Yes. Uh, our recent data, to my surprise, has shown that occupants in new apartment buildings in the metropolitan Hartford region have been coming from out of the region, out of state, and even sometimes elsewhere. So those numbers are running much higher than I've typically anticipated, so I feel pretty good there. On the commercial one, you have to remember that the commercial taxes being paid aren't necessarily the business tax, but they're the fixtures and furnishings and equipment within. Uh, once again, let's just say a restaurant. If it was a restaurant that was already in town moving to this new location, in most instances, businesses like that don't move all their fixtures, furnishings, and equipment with them. They actually invest in new when they're fitting out a new space. So I approach it from the assumption that these new fixtures, furnishings, and equipment are actually new and not necessarily just shuffling around, or at least the overwhelming majority. In this case, we're dealing with hoods and so forth in some of the in the restaurant designated space. So more than likely new on the high high value items. Okay, thank you. Um, the process also <coughs> says that the tax incentive policy according to the Connecticut general statutes that uh, the town has adopted, this policy establishes a tax incentive program for the town and that we should be looking at that Connecticut general statute. It looks like the Connecticut general statute that was put in our packet was incorrect. Um, it looks like there's an updated version of our Connecticut general statutes. That's the one I printed off the internet. It looks like it's old. 12, what is it, 12 dash something B? That's the most recent one I got off the Connecticut General Statutes website. Okay. Basically what happened is they uh, took the lids off any of the abatements. So as we adopted the policy <coughs> in 2004, there were more restrictions on the abatements. The new legislation has broadened the abatement capabilities of the town. It looked like in 2016 they, they did do that, but it looked like it was a different uh, attachment than was attached into the packet. Okay. okay. And then uh, another thing it also says is the process gives 35 days to approve this after it's first presented to the council, and that gives people um, a chance to look at the 100 pages that are presented so everybody can have uh, a little bit to present and, I mean, a little bit of time to look at this stuff and uh, have and talk about it at the next council meeting, which I would suggest, I mean, to Paul's point that we still keep this council, but we do it in like three weeks. I don't think that'll hurt anything to put it off for three weeks. And I'd like to mo motion to table the current action to give interested parties the time to review the attached 100 pages. I'll second the motion to table for discussion purposes. Amy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if, if we're all in agreement that this, is a, this project is a good project for the town, we've seen the spreadsheets showing the increased revenue um, that the town will receive. It's uh, been unanimously approved by the Tax Abatement Board, who are our um, town officials, the town manager, town planner, assessor, and the chairperson of EDIC. Um, and it was also presented to us in our budget and finance subcommittee meeting where we did not approve it, but there was agreement um, to put it on this agenda. I don't feel the need to table this. I think that we have the facts, that, facts and figures that we need and that um, we should move forward and you know, be fair to the developer and get the project going. To, to echo Amy's comments, I mean, this the packet, while there's a lot of information in it, it's no different than packets we get every single meeting we have. It's not, 
any more complex. We've had it for a weekend uh, ourselves to look at. Mike, you've had this information at budget and finance um, uh, since Tuesday. Since Tuesday of last week, um, it's it's ready. It's delay is 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 not. There's no reason for it. So I I would uh, not be in favor of uh, tabling. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mike. Um, I think that's the process gives the 35 days, and I think that's why the process does give 35 days. Because I don't, I think we might have looked at it. Um, there's still 100 pages to look through, and I believe that the process is good for the community itself. It's 35 days, and there's a reason for it. Um, voting on it right now is just like anything else we push through, um, and I don't believe that. This is the same thing as other items that come up. This is a big deal for our town. I think 15 more days isn't going to hurt anybody, and I believe that this is the right thing to do. Jeff, just a quick question. Uh, the 35 days, isn't it to come before council from the date it's submitted? No, uh, there's a time frame that the committee has to do its work okay. and present it to the council, then the council has 35 days, according to the policy, if they need okay. to, to act from the day of the council meeting. And one other thing, um, I don't believe Weight Watchers was good faith. I mean, that's my only belief, but I just want to put that out there. Other comments on the table? We're talking about the table right now, so. I mean, I'll echo Mike's point. I mean, we, we do have 35 days to give uh, the public additional information. I think tonight, if people are watching at home, you know, I know some reporters are here. Uh, they will uh, put this in the paper. People will comment about it, I'm sure, on social media and get a little buzz going. And, you know, I, I think uh, simply by having it out there to the public, uh, sunlight is, uh, is better than no sunlight on something like this. So, um, you know, I don't think it might sway anybody's opinion. Um, just simply having it out there for l more than 72 hours notice to vote on for the public to gain information about um, I think does a, a, a service to the public thank you thank you Mike other comments on the table motion okay um, I we we obviously have had some public response in very short order we actually have a <laughs> pretty full chambers and have had a fair amount of comment tonight on this. So I think I know there was some pu public posting and Facebook posting to come out on this and obviously it generated that response. Um, ultimately, I think this decision comes down to the leadership of the town though and assessments of abatement, uh, even with town input, it still comes down to the leadership. And um, I, I don't support tabling it. I support leading right now and leading with the current group that has worked on this. And I'm certainly prepared and I suspect some others are as well. So. We have a motion and a second to table. I think we'll do a hand count in favor or against. So, Dolores, if you can do a, a roll call. Councillor Bello? No. Councillor Hammond? No. Councillor Hurley? Yes. Councillor Latina? No. Councillor Martino? No. Councillor Rao? Yes. Councillor Spinella? No. Deputy Mayor Barry? No. Mayor Montaneri. No. So the table fails. Um, I want to go back to discussion, with remaining discussion on the original motion on the abatement request. Any other comments from council? Anything we want to add in? Covered a lot of ground. Okay. We have a motion and a second in front of us with respect to an abatement request by Lexington Partners. Again, I'd like to have a Dolores do it by individual. Okay, this is for the uh, project going forward. Councilor Bello? Aye. Councilor Hammond? Yes. Councilor Hurley? Abstain. Councilor Tina? Yes. Councilor Martino? Yes. Councilor Rao? Yes. Councilor Spinella? Yes. Deputy Mayor Barry? Yes. And Mayor Montaneri? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think that deserves a round of applause. For Five minute recess. Oh. Yeah. Motion for a five minute recess. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Paul, him, and Jeff are talking to a lot of people. Oh. 
questions. It's pub public demand. That's what it's called. Oh. It's not an investment. I mean, to win hmm? by staying, are you investing? 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 No, I just think we need more time to look at the material. That's it. Entertainment. Oh, no, I, I, I talked to Marty. I talked to Marty. I am 16. I never told anybody I was voting enough. No, I'm saying I'm not curious. Your discussion with Wayne. They were going to vote no, not abstaining, but just curious. Okay, this is, um, this is She watched it on TV. What's that? She probably watched it. No, no, Fonda's been here the entire time. I said, before Fonda, she picked the Can I get a motion to go back into session, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have three bids on the on the uh, agenda tonight. B A, please. <laughs> okay, where are we? We'll be all right. Somebody. Next gen. B B four A. Oh, okay. Motion to approve the purchase of next gen computer aided dispatch records management software for the Wethersfield Police Department for one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars seven hundred and seventy. $5.50. Second. We have a motion. A second. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Chief Chatrans here to, this evening to answer any questions. Basically, we're replacing our computer aided dispatch and records management software with a more effective product. Chief. Okay, I forgot everything I came here for anyway, so. <laughs> Um, we uh, obtained a, um, an RMS CAD back in 2003. The town spent a quarter of a million dollars on it. We had problems with from day one. Uh, so in 2007, I actually found out that the Chiefs of Police Association for the state of Connecticut owned a license for an RMS CAD that was called CT Chiefs. So it sounded like a great deal because we wouldn't have to spend any money on it. it with the license and the program was, uh, the fee was free. Um, and then we were able to wangle that we would actually go on to the CJA servers, the state of Connecticut servers, so we wouldn't even need any hardware. So basically it was a free system. The maintenance was going to be a quarter of what we were paying already for Visionaire at the time. So it sounded like a great deal, but as great deals, it didn't come to fruition as, as the way I expected. KTI was the uh, firm that got the bid for the RMS CAD, and uh, we got 
and went on to CT Chiefs in May of 2016. We had a lot of problems. There was a lot of bugs. The chief in Newington actually described it as trying to fly a plane as they're building the plane. And that's a good analogy because it just wasn't working. Now KTI is going out of business because they didn't get the money that was sufficient to, to keep the program going. In the meantime, another company, Telepartners, which runs the captain system, which has been around for 20 years and does work very well, is going to take over CT Chiefs. But again, it's under development. It's, it's, there's just too many things that are going wrong with it. One of the things that is, that is particularly troublesome is the fact that we were NIBRS compliant. That's the way you report your crime statistics. We've been NIBRS compliant since 2003. CT Chiefs is not NIBRS compliant. The state of Connecticut won't let you go back to UCR, Uniform Crime Reports. So we have not been able to get our statistics into the state. So uh, we actually got notified by OPM, Office of Policy and Management, that we won't be getting our JAG grant until we submit our statistics. Well, we've been submitting the statistics, it's just that they can't read them because CT Chiefs doesn't interpret them correctly. So it's gotten to the point where I really didn't want to do this, um, but it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. <clears throat> so the two choices that we really had, if we didn't stay with CT Chiefs, then I had to go with Visionaire, which is now called TriTech, they were bought out by TriTech, or go with NextGen. TriTech, I was expecting some leniency from them in the cost because of the fact that that's what we had since 2003. But they claimed that our, the upgrades would be so extensive because of the fact that we had an upgrade for quite a while, which is true. And they were actually asking for almost the same amount of money that NextGen wants. NextGen, I'm not crazy with dealing with either, but NextGen has a corner on the state. I mean, 80% of the municipal departments and the state police are all NextGen. All the bugs are worked out. It's a finished product. Really don't have to worry about it anymore. And perhaps, maybe, I won't get as many complaints from records, dispatch, and the officers. So I uh, decided to spend the asset forfeiture money. I'm not asking for any budgeted money. Um, we'll spend the asset forfeiture money and, and purchase the product. Hopefully, they are NIBRS compliant. When we are up and running, we should be able to get our grants back, and uh, things should be better in the future. Thank you, Chief. We have questions for the Chief on this? <coughs> Mike? No? No question? Okay. We approve. When does this, uh, you, do you do this right away? Well, over? nothing happens right away. <laughs> I was told by NextGen that if we did go with them, if I do go with them, that it will be a minimum of 90 days before it will be completed, which is pretty fast. Right. In fact, I think that's even faster than they can it'll really do it. will beat the pool blocks. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Amy? It, it, how disruptive is this to your department and to the public? We've already done it twice. The public shouldn't see anything. The staff will, but it's just part of the, you know, it's part of what you have to do. The transition shouldn't be too great. It's just a matter of training. It's the same stuff. It's just different ways of doing it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Same. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. And. Uh, Thanks for your service, Donna. Goodbye. Paul, Steve. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Good luck. 4B, please. Motion to approve equality as the vendor for the townwide property revaluation at a cost of $156,575.50. Second. Motion and second. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. It's time once again to do our every fifth year. Uh, townwide appraisal of the property. Fauna Eller, the town assessor, is here to talk about the program and equality and uh, what we're going to do this time around to be more effective and save a ton of money.
Good evening. Um, I'm usually in bed by now, so I'm going <laughs> to try to <laughs> be awake. Um, yeah, so it's our, every five years we do reval. Every 10 years we have to do a full measure and list um, for the sake of saving money and cost effectiveness. Um, we're going to use data mailers. Um, so that's important that they're in there. We're going to send a second round for anybody who didn't return one. And um, the entry rates these days are less than 50%. So why pay to go in every house when you're getting in less than half? Um, uh, so the work the revaluation company is going to do is send out the data mailers, uh, take new photographs of all the properties. Um, we're going to be doing a software conversion. Um, the map geo site that everybody looks at, that will not change. You can still look at everybody's property just like you always had. Uh, so that will still be available. Um, and uh, that's about it. Is it. Do you guys have any other questions? Uh, the work we're going to be doing in the office, we'll be entering all the data mailers. I'll be doing uh, any inspections that are a result of a data mailer where somebody's requesting an inspection. And uh, that's about it. You want to talk a little bit about the pictometry element to this? Uh, yeah, we, we want to make use of a service. It's There's a couple different names for it, sketch verification, sketch check. Um, it will take our sketches that are in our CAMA software, our new software that we would get, and overlay those sketches over the actual aerials of what's on the ground and verify that the sketch that we have in the system is accurate. So we'll be making use of that as well. So we'll be able to... I, I think it's almost better than having a person on the ground measuring. Uh, so we'll make use of that new technology as well. In the past, this has cost well over 300 to 400. Oh, I think last time our bid just for the reval was like 475 from Vision, yeah. and that didn't include software. Right. So. It's, it's, a, it's a significant savings, and we'll be doing extra work in the office, too, to cut down on costs. Is it the software that's making the difference? Is that the saving? No. I, you know, I don't... The software in general, they only seem to run like fifteen to 25,000, and I, you'll have it for multiple years. Um, so, no, it's not... It's the, it's the actual people measuring the houses that is the significant savings. So I just I'm just want to make sure I understand. So the data mailer is going to go to residents. Yep. And they're going to fill it out. Mm -hmm. And it will be like, can you give me an example of some of the questions that would be on it? it? It will be the factual interior data. I mean, it will include a, a sketch. I don't know if everybody's going to go out and look at their house in that manner, but you're, it'll be bedroom count, room count, type of heating system, uh, just factual interior information that we'd look, be looking for with that data mailer. Any improvements they made to the property on the inside. And keep in mind, we were getting in less than half already. If somebody's not going to let you in, they're not going to fill out the data mailer. You know, we're, we're going to try to do it the best we can, um, get the best data that we can, but you can't make someone do anything. So that's the <laughs> short of it. Amy. What is the time frame for this project? Uh, we will start the project. Uh, I have them sending out mailers within 30 or 60 days. Um, everybody will get their value notice November 8th. We'll send those out. The reval company will also send out those value notices. So that's pretty much the end of the project. And then we will also be hosting in the informal reviews to also cut costs. We'll be doing that ourselves. That's something. Uh, Reval company would do. Clear. Yep. November 8th, 2018. November 8th, 2018, correct. Sorry. 18. This <laughs> yeah. takes a full year yeah. to do. Yeah. Okay, seeing no further questions, uh, we have a motion and a second. On this direction, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Okay. Finally, thank you. Um, thank you, Fauna, for sitting up so long. <laughs> 4C, please. Staff meeting at 8.30. <laughs> Motion to award the salt bid to DRVN for $62.50 a ton and Eastern Salt for $62.50 a ton. Second. 
motion a second, Jeff, and I assume Sally's here. Sally is go. here. Hi, Sally. Um, salt, it's that time of year. It is that time of the year. Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services. Um, what you have before you is uh, we have gone out to bid for rock salt. We do our own bids. We don't go off the state bids because we found in previous years that we can do very well on pricing and also availability. We like to split it between two different companies so that if there's any disruption in their supply chain, we can um, access the material from the other company. Um, this year, you will notice that um, we were able to receive pricing that is $2 less than last year. Um, so we've been able to get favorable pricing uh, and uh, want to move forward so that we can lock them in um, knowing that snow season isn't that far off. No, I think we're getting a bit of price because three years ago we got slammed Yes. Price got up, got stockpiles up. got low. Yes. Last year was kind of mild, so people are sitting on salt. Mm -hmm. Got it. Questions for Sally on this? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, we have a motion and a second in favor of the bid award, or the lower price, I might add. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. The October 2nd meeting minutes, please. Motion to approve the meeting minutes of October 2nd, 2017. Second. Motion and a second. Um, any changes, deletions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Public comment? Public comment. Bob Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, Mr. Manager, during some discussions, you had spoke about the uh, S&P uh, issue of the negative, the negative uh, uh, bond ratings and how it's affecting everybody. Yeah. And um, that's due to the uh, uh, de declining population, uh, the reduced revenues, and of course, the substantial tax increases that we've had over the last eight years. Actually, or the six challenge years. was because we don't have a state budget. And because we don't have a state yeah. budget. Shame on us. But the fact remains, it affects all of us. You know, all the money that we have asked for from the state, that Amy kept asking for through her, whatever those grants are, you ran them dry, Amy. You ran them dry. And same with all the kinds of monies that we were asking for from the state. We ran it dry. All of them, all the towns have ran it dry. Um, I don't know, you, you gotta get it, guys. You can't keep going to the well. Eventually it dries up. Um, also, Tonight, there was a number of people that came to this podium and spoke about the tough job you folks have and all the accomplishments that you've had and all the great, great things you've done. I can think of a few. I can think of shared services. Um, after 20 some years, uh, I think you got what, the IT group now running both town and the Board of Ed. I don't know what else you have. But uh, that's something I can think about. You did rip through a, uh, uh, a Ridge Road abatement, same kind of way you did tonight. And tonight, you did the same. Uh, Cloverdale Pond looks pretty good. I, uh, I caught hell because I said, well, you should be consider selling it, but I, because it looks so good at this point. But it would be something to consider. Maybe a neighbor would buy it and take care of it forever and ever. Eternal life. Um, I, I, I look upon what you folks do as a lot of um, autopilot. <laughs> you have staff that takes care of all the things that you send down to them or up to them. 
You sit here and you talk about buying sand and you talk about buying whatever. And you vote and you go on home. Yeah, you have to read up on it a little bit. But I don't consider that tough, a tough job. Maybe tax abatements are a tough job. That's a tough one. But, uh, you know, it's interesting to hear this man who came up with the developer tonight. It was his name, Mr. Polin. How he had, Polin, Polin, the guy with the statistics, um, to talk about how we are seeing a decline in population. You know, same thing goes with S&P. Uh, we build a school 30% bigger than what we should have built. It made no sense. Granted, probably tomorrow, it'll be full. Not with our students, but students from somewhere else. You don't know, especially with the Puerto Rico wipeout down there. I mean, with the, with the problems in Harford, where they have to move kids out of somewhere, we might end up with some of them. And, uh, but we didn't need a 30% increase in our school, which also meant a huge amount of money of increase as well that now we had to borrow. Um, with our financial problems, and I keep coming back to what are we going to do about them? I know you don't know what the exact number is, but do we have things in, in play for when, it, when you don't get money? I mean, if you do get money, well, then everything falls back to where it should be. But there should be at least a discussion among you folks to us as to what your plans are. Um, part of the heavy conversation tonight was regarding the advocates who plead for program funds. Tonight I heard Jeff, town manager, say that you're pleading too with the state legislators. Am I correct in what I heard? To get a budget yeah. done, yes. So, so, so you're another one of mine on the list that's a pleader for money. I'm glad I made the list, Bob. You made the list. I'm on the list. You made Gosh. the list, which is pretty good. So, I waited my entire life for that. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm done. And uh, I'll see you next time. Good night. Public comment, Tom. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. Uh, I was kind of surprised at the way the evening went with regards to the Borden tax abatement. And from what I read, <clears throat> you were either approving or denying a tax abatement. The project was already approved. And if I'm not mistaken, they've had all their approvals. They could have started construction. It was their choice not to proceed with the construction until they ironed out the tax abatement issue. Even when Dolores took the final vote, she said, we're voting to approve the project. The project was already approved. Planning and zoning approved it. The Wetlands Commission approved it. All Lexington partners needed to do was apply for a building permit and pay the fees. I'm also disappointed in statements that I made from this letter that was in the packet from the assessor. And it states, Mr. Kenny had told the town that he would not be able to do the project without some sort of help from the town in the form of tax reductions. However, did still build the project and it is compl uh, approaching completion. I'm reading it verbatim. And they denied that they ever asked for any assistance from the town of Glastonbury. Tom, just what was your source on that? It's a letter that says assessor summary, yeah. and it's in the packet. Yeah, it's in the packet. Fauna reached out from to Fauna. Fauna, she called the town of Glastonbury and asked some pertinent questions about 
the pr uh, their history with Lexington Partners. Okay, I just want to be clear what your source was on. I didn't know if you were quoting so, our packet or, or something from Glastonbury, but they, they clearly they denied it. From Glastonbury they did not get any assistance. They got assistance on the project. They did not get any assistance from the town of Glastonbury. That's what this says. And I strongly believe that they would have proceeded with the project without any assistance from the town of Wethersfield. And there was also a discussion about, I, I, I feel like people put words into my mouth because I was pretty clear on what I said. I wrote it down so I got it right, that we were going to lose revenue. I never said it was going to be taxpayers losing the money. It was revenue, okay? No one else wanted to talk about the $5 million that taxpayers are supporting that project with through the state. It's, we're all taxpayers in the state. Anyways, I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but I think you could have done a better job at negotiating with the builder, Lexington Partners, for a better deal. You don't, you don't play poker, I hope, because you could have said no, and there's every possibility they still would have proceeded with the project, just as they did in Glastonbury. Thank you. Thank you. George? George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I got a couple of things right tonight. This was the last meeting for this council. Uh, some of you will be back, and I'll look forward to seeing you. Some of you I've known for a long time, and I think if I had to look over this council, I'd say Dolores, uh, Steve, and I knew him when he was little, and I've known Donna for a long time. So uh, Godspeed on your new parts of life. Uh, as far as Weathersfield's concerned, you know I'm not leaving. But today, the street was finished, the pond is done, and boy, it sure in heck looks good. Uh, I've got, we have a lot of visitors over there. I worry about the kids taking all those big rocks that are under the weir and heaving them into the pond. And every once in a while, I say, hey, don't do that, you know. Sometimes the father gets a little ticked off. Some father got ticked off at me the other day because I told his kid he didn't think it was such a hot idea. But I think that was an accomplishment that was, it was a small thing relatively to the, relative to the whole town. But it did, it did make a positive impression on the people in, the, in that part of the town. And it really made a real great impression on my wife, okay? So she looks out every day and the grass is coming through and it looks good and we thank you for it. So Godspeed, good luck, and see you next year for maybe another year or so, I don't know. <laughs> Any other public comment? Dave? Hello, Dave Kirk, 149 Broad Street. I want to keep it positive. I know it's the last meeting for some of you guys. Uh, I, some things uh, I didn't like at the meeting. You know, there was a little squabbling in, in, during this meeting, and it started off with uh, Councillor Spinella bringing up some uh, some questionable things and uh, then it went back and forth and and I was thinking I don't care about any of that I just want to see this project move forward because I I like a lot of you was very disappointed that the Weight Watchers building uh, was not uh, the deal fell through you know I it kind of reminded me of like when everyone thought the Patriots were coming to Hartford. It, but uh, the difference is a lot of people didn't believe the hate Patriots were really coming. In this case, most people really believed Weight Watchers would be, you know, sold and we'd have a new building there. So it was a disappointed. I don't think anyone uh, did anything wrong. It just it just didn't work out for what whatever reason. I don't know what the reason was, but it just didn't work out. But um, well, I guess there's a lot of... A lot of reasons. It could be legal issues, financial issues. It could be. It could be anything. But uh, I, I'm glad you approved it. I, w I wish there wasn't this uh, little debate beforehand. And, and as far as the pages, you know, you know, if if if, uh, if a if a developer wants to develop it and they want to go through with it, and you have a bunch of papers to look through, read through it quickly. You know, you want to. You don't want to delay. You know, that that's the worst. That you, I was. 
it makes me think of the the federal government they delay everything nothing gets through because everyone's arguing with each other and uh, taking sides and I, I hope uh, our town council doesn't turn into that you know the last time uh, it's been quite a few years before I send seen you know squabbling between the parties uh, and the town council uh, I, I was trying to think back uh, maybe small ones but uh, the last time I could think of really heated differences was during our ethics and the Board of Ed that was that was a dirty time nasty horrible time it was it was ugly and it was uh, people it, the Democrats and the Republicans didn't like each other and they were taking sides it was it was terrible but I hope that doesn't happen again but that was that was like probably like 15 years ago but um, but uh, I'm gonna miss you guys uh, 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 I think twice about my votes after today I was uh, thinking I, at first I was gonna do pull the party line you know the, the lever although there's no lever anymore but uh, I, I thought, you know, I, I, I was gonna say, I, I, I was gonna say, well, I want this party on the on the town council. I'm not gonna say who, but uh, now I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'm gonna think of you guys individuals. So I'm gonna vote for who I like individually, and I, I think that's the best thing. Thanks. Any other public comment? Anything for the good of the order? Um, just I, I, one thing. Go ahead. We did have um, letters uh, about, uh, against speaking out against the uh, abatement, which you all had at your yeah. yep. table. So just, I just wanted to mention that we did get them. Amy, I'm sorry, did you? No, I was going to make the motion, I but I think there's no. discussion you, down at the end. I have some. So the next gathering of this group, you can't. you have to come back at least one more time. What's the date of that, Dolores? It's the first Monday after the election? Yes. 13th. Which will be what? The 13th? Yeah. There'll so be no sure. business. You'll just pass the gavel and they'll swear in the new members. But you, all three are required to attend. Please. What's the penalty it's if November they don't? 13th. <laughs> you can never come back. What about those of us who might not come back? <laughs> we still have to or be you here. want to do it at 7 just before yeah, we do the other part? <laughs> What's the other part? When the other ones get sworn in. Yeah, we'll just do seven and okay. bang, bang. Okay. okay. Good. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And, and Tom, they did have an issue where they couldn't just get a building permit. The sewer alignment changed from going out to the Silas, and they had to go send it down to Mill Street.